I told you guys we were starting right on the dot. We're starting right on the dot. Let's go. Okay, a couple things real quick. You guys have been awesome so far with the questions. Remember that. Keep them quick, keep them pithy. Let's keep it going. We want as many people as possible to be able to ask questions and make comments, so let's just keep that in mind. Uh, we got a lot of people not here who listen to the show, like tens and tens of thousands. They're all going to want to know what the top ten list is or the top one game. Look, you're here. You paid for tickets. They're not here. They didn't pay for tickets. Don't spoil the show. It's coming out like Monday, okay? So let's not put it on Discord. Let's not put it on the Reddit. I know somebody's going to, but like, let's let as many people enjoy it as possible to not tell them like what the top game is, all right? You guys have been killing it with the merch. Thank you so much, by the way. That really helps us out a lot. Our All American Made stuff, we really have a, a big value in that. Um, we, th we hope you like the lower price points from the old merch. Woo! Keep buying it. Remember, guys, that Sacred 200 poster that, by the way, Hodge made. <laughs> that thing's a limited edition. There's only so many of them. Get them while you're here. Uh, they're 10 bucks. By the way, if you're flying or you're driving and you're worried about that, uh, we inc we're including, like, for free, uh, a poster roll. Like, you don't have to worry about it getting crushed in your luggage, right? We, we treat our fans right. Grab a poster, don't worry about it getting destroyed. There we go. Now, I know some of you may know our good friend, Locke Mort. Yes! And Locke is really upset he couldn't be here. I love Locke. We hope he's going to come to the next one. But in the meantime, he worked up a little something for you guys. And for the boys. Let's check it out. Greetings and salutations. Jaguar. I'm Betty Ann, and I'm Colin's mom. Jag Jaguar. I should note that I'm Microsoft shareholder. Guess what? I'm Dustin's mom. That's wild. Who are you? I'm Mrs. Maldonado. I'm Chris's mom. It turns out I'm really hard to get a hold of. Okay. You can be anybody you want online. I want to be a video game tester. Are you Colin's mom? Oh my gosh, thank you for knowing that. <laughs> <laughs> so when Colin was growing up, what he wanted to be, I think, was Mega Man. Growing up, Chris was always, he, he spray painted his bike helmet green. Dustin, growing up, wanted to be literally a uh, video game tester. I used to watch the show every week until they added that round-headed fellow, and I just couldn't take it anymore. Jaguar. <laughs> it's stupid. If you don't like it, move on. I think my son has built a really wonderful um, business. And I think that he has wonderful people surrounding him, not only the fans. Kingdom Hearts fans, stand down. What's Kingdom Hearts about, tell me? Between Final Fantasy XIV and uh, Kingdom Hearts, it's got to be Final Fantasy. If it had been out when he was younger, like maybe he wouldn't have been a Mega Man fan. Maybe it really would have been Kingdom Hearts. My favorite part of the LSM content is the audio editing. Forward on Mother's Day, the longer version of Sacred Moms. The crew didn't know about that, or the guys didn't know about that, by the way. Now, if you could please join me in standing for the singing of the Gamer Battalion Anthem by Mrs. Holly Furman.
Austin, what the hell is this? What the fuck is that? Jaguar. Are you fucking serious? It's horrible. look from you yeah wow Is the mic on? There we go. <laughs> Greetings and salutations. Welcome to Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast. This is episode number 200. Yeah! My name is Colin Moriarty. I'm joined as always by my son, Chris Raygun. <laughs> and of course, executive producer, my other son, Dustin Furman. No, no. Don't fill his head up too oh. much. Thank you guys for being here today. Uh, and a, a round of applause first for Snark Tank, please. Yeah. <laughs> what is with this table? I feel like I'm at like a quaint French cafe. Yeah. <laughs> guys, we're here. We're in Richmond. Welcome to Virginia, my new adopted home. Uh, can't wait to see the... Kotaku headline of this show, uh, <laughs> Sacred Symbols, 200th episode in Confederate Capital City. <laughs> <laughs> That's very real, you understand? Yeah, <laughs> that is there's a on. decent chance. Um, and I think I was told that we sold 420 tickets. Blaze it, baby! <laughs> Um, so before we get started, uh, I want to remind you all, we don't know what the list is going to be that we show today. Uh, it's the 25 greatest PlayStation 4 games. Uh, yeah, PlayStation 4, wonderful console, 2013, of course, and uh, boys, I'm excited to get into it. Chris, how do you feel? First of all, you must be tired. You're a little fatigued. No, I feel pretty good. That woke me up yeah. doing the last show. Because, so what happened was, I got no sleep at all. Uh, but uh, I think I'm at that point of delirium where I'm just like energized to like a fatal degree. Yeah. But we'll see, we'll, we'll worry about that later. I have insurance. Your work, yeah, your work. We have event insurance as well. I think everything will be okay. And, yeah. Um, you're working at perhaps a little bit of an advantage then over us because I'm not warmed up. Dustin? How do you feel? You seemed a little concerned. You came over la last night. You were concerned about, you know, you had a lot of things to do. Uh, right, yeah. It all I came mean, together, though. You did a really wonderful job. Everyone should give Dustin and Ben. A thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we were getting merch together, and that was a big ordeal. But, you know, it's worked out. Shout out to Holly and Micah and also uh, Allie selling merch of back course. there. Yeah. Doing a great job. But, uh, you know, I'm not, I haven't been nervous at all or anything like that. You know, I... I was thinking, uh, I also want to shout out my dad is here, who's, I don't know where he is, he's back in the back. But I was thinking, 
a lot of people wouldn't necessarily like, you know, having your dad involved with your stuff that might be embarrassing. What if he wears a weird shirt or something? And then I thought, I'm wearing a Misato t-shirt, so really he should be embarrassed of me. But we are. Good. <laughs> but other than that, you know, it's been great. Yeah. Well, I'm proud of you guys. And um, before we get into it, and Ben, where are you? You're over there. You're going to keep us honest as far as timing is concerned as we go through the games. Um, I first want to, again, thank everyone for being here. We couldn't do it without you. Um, it's incredible that Sacred Symbols has resonated with so many people. And uh, I'm proud of everyone that's involved in it. These guys do a wonderful job. The guys do a wonderful job editing it. But it's all for you. And um, I didn't expect that it would become like the biggest fan-funded video game podcast in the history of the internet. But uh, it is. And uh, we do that just because of you, independent, fan-funded. We have no relationships with PR. Um, in fact, most of them hate me. So it's pretty easy for me not to work with them. Because even if I wanted to, they probably wouldn't answer me anyway. So I've used it to my advantage. Um, but enough about all of that. You guys are here for one reason, and it's to go through the 25 PlayStation 4 games. 25 to 1. Now remember, I voted, Chris voted, Dustin voted, and you all voted. Now, none of us know the answers. I am ready to be disappointed in all of you. <laughs> Very ready indeed. Um, before we go into it though, uh, I want some just last minute gut checks about games you might expect and where. Chris, uh, is there any game you expect to appear on the list at a certain specific uh, spot? I don't know, man. I think the thing that disappointed me, right, is that I was thinking about it and I was like, damn. Balan Wonderworld doesn't qualify. <laughs> and that really, doesn't. like, genuinely made me sad. Like, I woke up crying. But can, can as, we... Uh, I, was, I just want to say, can we acknowledge the, the incredible humor in the legal story that has come out about that game in the last week? <laughs> oh, it's so funny. Um, it is insane. Balan Wonderworld is technically a PS5 game, so it won't be on the list. Dustin, any guesses? Any guesses? Well, I... So, I was an arm's reach away from all the voting. But one thing that Ben did tell me, he said, hmm, Life of Black Tiger has a significant amount of votes. And I swear, if Life of Black Tiger is on this list, I'm, I'm just gonna get up and leave. I'm done. Yeah, I don't think it's possible. No I, show. I, I, yeah, that would be, that'd bother me a lot. But yeah. again, I'm expected to be disappointed. And um, Ben, should we begin the countdown? Should have been lower. That's not the real one. Go ahead and let's do it. Oh, hell yeah. Undertale. Okay. Oh. Interesting. All right, so what we did here was, uh, it's 25 through 1, but there are ties that we've tried to respect. So this is tied for 25th. Now, uh, aren't you playing this right now? I am, yeah. Well, this was, you know, I couldn't vote before I had played it, but I am playing it right now. So this is kind of So this is why it's on the list. Yeah, maybe. Okay. I you, willed it onto the list. How do you feel about it? I think it's, I think it's definitely one of them. I think it's, it's, it, I'm really enjoying it a lot more than I thought I would, and I'm pretty deep into it at this point. Like, I think it's one of those games that, it's, it's like Prey to me, where, like, when I played it the first time, I was like, what the fuck? What is this? What is the point of this? And then like, I played it like years later, and I was like, oh, I get it, it clicks. And I think Undertale was that for me this time, where like, I played it years ago, and I was like, what, the, what is this chiptune bullshit? Like, didn't we do this already? And aren't there like, I don't know, I was thinking like Cyber Shadow and all these others, like, it's like so much better. And then, you know, it, I played it recently, and it clicked, so I'm kind of happy to see it here. Yeah, Undertale. Uh, you've beaten this game, haven't you? This game was very high on my list. In fact, it was number five, so... Nerd. Yeah, so... <laughs> Here's the thing, guys. So th <laughs> Everyone knows this. Undertale fans are the worst. And we all know this. But the thing is, when you have something like this that is so beloved, usually it's because there's something to it. And I've said this on the show before, but Undertale is at its core a game about empathy. And I feel like more than ever, this game could resonate with so many people. And of course, there's the, the, the music, which has become like a meme, basically, at this point. So I'm very, very pleased to see this make the list. Ben, where are you? I need you. Ben, is he gone? I'm here. What? 
Do we want to hear from anyone in the audience about Undertale? I don't know. Does anyone have anything to say about Undertale? Anyone? Yeah, I don't, I don't really have anything to say about it either. Screw you. That's you guys the, suck. Undertale's fact, great. I'm a, I'm a little bit confused about... Like, I have my list here. No one's seen it. You guys can't see it, but uh, all of these games are better than Undertale, I would assume. <laughs> Please let the next one be Last of Us Part 2. Pray. Funny. Ah... This is, so, uh, this is so interesting. So these are getting spiked just from one high vote from each of us. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay, fair enough. Pray. Chris, talk to us about it. I just, I looked at how weird. No, this is one of those games, man. It's just, this is a really special fucking game. Like this is, I, this might actually be a little bit sacrilegious to say on, on the show, but I do think Prey 2017 rivals and even some ways, and even in some ways surpasses Bioshock. I think... I'm not kidding. I'm not... I, I, that's a hot take, I'm aware. I'm gonna have to hit you with the one stand down of the show <laughs> on that one. It really I'm gonna is. have to. It Sorry. really is, dude. I, like, I, I swear to God. If you haven't played Prey, and, like, and, and I mean really played it, like really like understood what it is that you were playing, because immersive sims are kind of... They're weird. Like, when I first played Prey, like, I didn't understand what the hell that was. Because so many genres, like Fallout and, and, and things like it, borrow elements of it, but never really, like, commit to the, the real freedom that you have in these kinds of experiences. And, and they're usually a little bit more slimmed down in, in surface area. They're not like, hey, here's a big sprawling world for you to bullshit around in and, like, gives you the illusion of choice just because you can go behind the house instead of in, in, like, through the front door. They're usually a little bit more curated, and because they're designed so specifically, they're able to have these situations where it's like, oh, do I need to have like, a skill to hack this door, or can I, can I just put a box here? <laughs> can I pick up something and actually block the door from closing all the way? And that gives me, like, just these, the interactivity of it is really staggering, and I didn't see it the first time, and I, I wish I did. But I'm glad I eventually did, and I'm, happy to ju I'm just happy that it's on the list at all. I think it's genuinely one of the most underrated things I've ever played. And uh, I'm happy to see Arcane represented. Yeah, I, I, yeah that's fine, that's fine. <laughs> Am I, isn't it, is that Ar Arcane spelled wrong? Or is that, was it, is it C? That's right? Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's K. John L. Yeah, fired. Stan, you're done. He's writing the new game, so we might be in a little bit of trouble. Uh, anyone out there have anything to say about Prey and Supporter? Or, uh... Oh, we got, we got Ben. Yeah? Ben, welcome. Thank you. Hey. Where are you going, Ben? Look, look man, I love Bioshock, but that ending is, is pretty... No, I don't yeah, want to I hear just... any more about Bioshock right now. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, just first off, absolutely love the show. But also, Thank yeah, you. Prey, I feel like, is just something everyone sleeps on all the time. And you can truly attack it in so many different ways. It's, it's amazing. I, I can't stop talking about it. Yeah, it's, it's a surprise, man. Like, I, I, I can't believe I hated it the first time. I put, it's so weird. Because you, you feel like a complete idiot when you go back to something. And you're like, what didn't I see in this before? Like, why do I see it now? What's going on? And you just, I don't know, it's, it's, it's frustrating simultaneously to go back and be like, why couldn't I just understand that this was good the first time? Well, when I lived in L.A., that's when I tried to play it. Yeah. It's one of those, I've just become more open admitting this, that I'm just not sophisticated enough for that game. Like, it's just too hard. Uh, you know, when in Tomb Raider, Shadow of the Tomb Raider or whatever, when it was just like, you want to just shut the puzzles off? I was like, yeah, that sounds, that sounds great. Because <laughs> it's just too sophisticated for me. All right. Can we please, God, get another game up here? Yay! Oh. Yay! Oh my God, no, what? I gotta get up, I can't see the audience and I gotta... Are you guys kidding me? No one voted for Rezogun. Maybe one of the greatest launch titles in the history of all games. What's, what's this? What is that? 
What do you mean? What's that game? What is that? I've never heard of it. <laughs> this really annoys me. Because <laughs> I had it at number four. We're, all, we're on totally different pages, everyone. Well, no, no. Because remember I told you, it will, we have ties for 25 that will remove certain, you know. Let's... <laughs> Dustin, what do you think of this? I think it's a fantastic game, and no doubt one of the best launch games. I think, what was the other? There was a different launch game, uh, Contrast. Oh, Contrast, yeah. Yeah, I mean, compared to that, not, no offense, but uh, this, is the, this was it, for sure. And uh, I think it's a fantastic game. But I, don't, it, I literally didn't even think of it when I was doing my ranking, so sorry, maybe? That's so disappointing. Our jobs are so easy. I think, though, the audience has my back because you see it says N-A, they're calling I can't even imagine N -A. what bullshit you guys actually voted for. North I can't America. even imagine. Chris, what, do you have anything to add? I mean, I've definitely heard of it. You no, look, 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 look. Yeah. It's, it's, a good, it's a good game, but like when, I was, when I was racking my brain for like the, top, the, like the best PS4 games of all time, like, I just, I don't know, like, it just, it, it slipped past my memory entirely. Because to me, it doesn't even register as a PS4 game. It feels like a classic, you know what I mean? No, I like, it's, it's just like, I was going through, like, a million other things before I even thought to think about Rise Hogan. Well, I don't know what to say about that. Anyone out there in defense of Rise Gun want to speak? Let's... Or if you have something bad to say about Rise Gun. It was a great game, it was my first Platinum, and it was like where I realized it was a great console. Like, it was, it was awesome. I just, I forgot to vote. It's on me. <laughs> there would have been one in there. You're, you're like me in 2020. I was just like, I'm not, I'm not doing this. <laughs> my answer is no. Oh, there's someone back there. Let's hear from you, my friend. I just want to say that the Vita version is amazing. Because you can fit it in your pocket, and yeah. it's an amazing game. I loved this game when it came out. I waited in line for the PS4, um, and the Vita version's where it's at, though. They, when I went and saw Housemark, welcome to the family, by the way, Housemark. Uh, one of the great studios out of Finland. Uh, they straight up promised me this game will never run and could never run on anything but the PlayStation 4. And, I and when I was at IGN, I wrote all about it and it big headlines it like, you know, Rezo Gun, PlayStation 4 exclusive. They say this voxel technology is too much. And then six months later, they bring it to PlayStation 3 and Vita, which is basically the PS2. So needless to say, I don't trust anything anyone tell tells me. Ben, let's move on to the next one. Oh! Let's go. All right, now we're cooking. Chris, I'm surprised to see that you didn't put this on your list. <sighs> Look, <laughs> I have a complicated relationship with Resident Evil, I think. I think because some, sometimes I think of it very fondly, and then other times I think of, you know, six. Um, and it's just, I think, when I played Resident Evil, uh, this one, <laughs> Seven. Yes. I just remember feeling like there was something about it that felt like a step back as far as like a horror genre goes. Because it's, it's like, okay, you're in a house, you know, and it's, 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 well, it's about the house. It reminded me a lot of Outlast and like a lot of independent horror games that I had seen kind of spring out on, on, in the PC space in the years leading up to Resident Evil 7. And I remember just sort of... I don't know, when I'm, when I'm looking forward to a Resident Evil 7, when I'm looking forward to a Resident Evil game, and it's a first-person horror game in a spooky house, you know, there's something about that that feels a little, like, disappointingly reductive uh, that I could not get past. Also, the FOV in that game is terrible. Like, distractingly bad. Like, I, I, I can't, I'm an FOV fiend. I apologize. This is the next thing you're going to break me on, probably. It's like, that's another thing I never noticed until I met you. You know, <laughs> kind of like, yeah, like kind of like frame rate where I was like, nah, I don't give a shit about the frame rate. And then Chris totally like beat me. Uh, Dude, it makes a difference, man. Like, yeah. and, and just like, especially when you're in this, you're fighting for your life. You're like, oh my God, this guy's got a, a, a chainsaw and he's coming at me in this, in this house. And then you sprint and it feels like you're tiptoeing. 
and it's just like, what is this? It would, this would, this would, you don't even have to make me faster. All you have to do is make the, the FOV wider and it'll feel faster. That's just like a nature of like what the FOV does. And I don't know, like, and, and then I, I played Resident Evil um, 8 and I remember being like, oh, this is what I like. The, the ridiculous. Did it have anything to do with the, the lady? Maybe. <laughs> I heard you have a thing for that. Somewhere, maybe on Twitter.com. Well, maybe. No comment on that one. But I just, I just, there was so much variety in that game, and like there's so many different locations and so so many different characters to interact with that felt like right out of. It felt like an evolution of four in the way that I, I I've wanted since four, where it's like it's still got that eeriness, it's still got that atmosphere, and it's still got that action, but the action is like appropriate. I think like eight like meanders a little bit in the beginning and the very end where it gets a little it loses me a little bit, but I still had a way better experience playing that game than than seven, and I, I just feel like it just comes down to all of the like like amnesia and 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 Outlast and all of these indie horror games that I'd played up until that point on the PC, that just sort of felt like oh this is that's this, and this is Resident Evil's take on this. I don't know if I want it. Resident Evil's take on this. <laughs> like, I don't know, like, there's so much of this already. Mm. Um, mm. And you have, like, the silly stuff in it with, like, you know, the, the mold. <laughs> and the shit, like, there's, there's campiness to it. There's that Resident Evil lunacy to it. But it's, it's also just, I don't know, it, feel, it just feels, it, it, it never crossed my mind when I was making this list. Chris, I've had enough. <laughs> because Resident Evil 7 clearly saved the IP. Maybe, yeah, that's and true. And it's an awesome game. Yeah, I mean, you know, awesome. Citizen Kane is probably really important too, but I'm not gonna fucking. <laughs> you know, I, I just... <laughs> it's a sledge. You're not gonna win. Oh, Rosebud, yeah. You know? No, I really do though. This game, um, the, I mean, the VR support was just so incredibly impressive, but was never something I personally could do. I walked around in, in the house at the beginning and thought, no, I'm, not for me, but very neat and clearly something that Sony saw value in because they never released the, the PC version to have VR. Uh, so it's like remained a forever exclusive feature. But like I, was, like I said, you know, this, this game before Resident Evil almost, was, it seemed like it might have been dead after, after six. Yeah. You know, it was, uh, that game was not hot at all. And so this just really, it kind of feels like the beginning of the Capcom revival. Yeah, really. I, I totally agree. Because it was, it was Monster Hunter World, Resident Evil. Uh, they started releasing collections, like the Mega Man collection, the Disney Afternoon collection, which was awesome. Uh, a few others. So Resident Evil 7, who wants to speak about it? Uh, this gentleman right here. It's hard to see, man. So was I the only one that was flabbergasted when the... <laughs> I don't even remember that part of it. Mm. Did that happen? I believe it. Memorable experience. <laughs> Stand down. <laughs> Here's what I loved about Resident Evil 7, which is the atmosphere, because it, it, it did, Resident Evil 5 was not good, and then 6, I was totally turned off because of that. And then this felt like it was celebrating the mansion or the, the whatever Louisiana Bayou house, whatever the fuck it is, uh, as like a character, right? Which is what Resident Evil is. It's the character. It's like why I'm so excited about the Dead Space remake. Because, of course, the greatest survival horror game of all time. Because the Ishimura, the spaceship in that, is a character. Just like old, you know, Alien and, and everything else in, back in the day. So I'm happy to see this on here. Resident Evil 7. Uh, Chris, I understand your argument. That's fine. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. And Sacred Symbols listeners get 10% off their first month of sessions at BetterHelp.com slash symbols. Trust me, my friends, I know anxiety. I know it really, really well. According to my psychiatrist, it spawns from depression, and it needs to be managed. It took me years to take the necessary steps to confront this, though. Years that I wasted not feeling right, but also not endeavoring to do anything about it. That's why I'm pleased our show is sponsored by BetterHelp, since I know that they can help crack the code for you if you're out there listening and you, too, aren't feeling quite right. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's this modern, simple, and convenient approach that makes all the difference, because there's no longer what I would certainly deem barriers to entry for mental health care. You don't have to drive anywhere, or take public transport, or even walk or grab an Uber. 
You don't have to sit in a waiting room, talk to a receptionist, and see anyone in person. It doesn't have to work like that anymore. And with BetterHelp, it doesn't. Instead, they match you up with a therapist within 48 hours of signing up, and BetterHelp's therapists are quite happy to meet you how you want. Phone, text, video, whatever. It's up to you. It's about making you feel better and making you comfortable. And I know through my own experience with therapy that it works. There's a reason millions of people are seeking therapy right now for what ails them. And there's a reason many of those people use BetterHelp, because it's effective. To be human is to sometimes be sad, unhappy, or down. That is the human condition. But you have to pick yourself up off the mat, my friends. Dust yourself off and seek help and advice from someone who specializes in what you're dealing with. Whether you're struggling with issues in your relationship or friendships or having trouble at work or dealing with something else that's taxing your mind, bringing you down, and not allowing you to be you, I think BetterHelp could, uh, help. And if you need the extra little nudge, well, you'll be glad to hear that BetterHelp isn't only more convenient than conventional therapy, but also more affordable. It's time to figure it out, my friends. You know exactly what I'm talking about. So head to BetterHelp.com slash symbols. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash S-Y-M-B-O-L-S. And begin your journey with therapy. I suspect you'll be glad you did. I know this will come as a surprise to many of you, but I'm not an expert on skincare. Unlike all things PlayStation, which I digest with reckless abandon, taking care of my skin amounts to one of life's great mysteries to me. So when Curology walked into my life, I was provided with something I didn't know I needed, but very much did. And you may have the same exact experience yourself at Curology.com slash sacred. For the uninitiated, Curology is skincare made easy, a totally online and by mail setup that provides you with custom made skin products targeted at not only you, the individual, but what you, the individual, are looking to achieve when it comes to your skin. My friends, if you want ultra easy skincare that's actually made for your skin, Curology is the way to go. You'll get a custom prescription cream made for you by a dermatology provider for your specific goals, whether that's tackling acne, clogged pores, skin texture, dark spots, fine lines, or something else. You start by taking a short online skin quiz, and if it's a good fit, they'll ship you your formula right to your door. Longtime fans will know that I actually had basal cell carcinoma on my face about a decade ago, and it came from my Long Island youth where my parents never one time for some strange reason ever told me to wear sunscreen. Maybe it's because I'm Italian and have that luxurious olive skin, but either way, it came back to bite me. And so now I try to be a little more attentive. Wearing sunscreen is obvious, but Curology's various products also help me. Their prescription application certainly did some work, but I was actually most into their cleanser and moisturizer, and I could feel the difference. My face felt cleaner after using the cleanser, and my face felt softer and more comfortable after using the moisturizer. Ah, comfort. If I could tell the difference, then I suspect some of you out there dealing with similar or other issues could see some results too. Fair or not, our skin is part of our outward presentation. It's how people see us. It's important to take care of your skin, not only so you don't experience serious issues like I did back in the day, but also because people can see the real live you, clear, clean skin and all. So get started with Curology just like I did with a free 30-day trial at Curology.com sacred. That's C-U-R-O-L-O-G-Y dot com slash S-A-C-R-E-D. Just pay $5 for shipping and handling. That's Curology.com slash sacred to start your free 30-day trial. Cancel anytime. Prescription subject to consultation. We often preach financial sanity on sacred symbols because it's important for everyone, you, me, literally all of us, to have control over our money. The foundation, of course, is built upon a bank account. And over at Chime, which you can check out right now at Chime.com slash sacred, you can not only open a bank account right this instant, but you can work to build up your credit score too, which is absolutely vital. See, if you're smart, credit should actually work for you, not against. By spending responsibly and making on-time payments, not only can you keep your financial house in order, but you can ever carefully build up your credit score, which is key to obtaining a car loan, an apartment lease, and so much more. Having bad credit is a killer. Having good or great credit is a godsend. Everyone knows that, and like so much in life, it's totally in your hands. With Chime's so-called Credit Builder Visa Credit Card, members can enhance their credit history with no annual fees or interest, I remember my dad telling me as a teenager in the 90s that having a credit card and paying it off promptly would be good for me. He was right, so I'm telling you the same thing. What are you waiting for, my friends? Continue your credit journey with Chime. Signing up only takes two minutes, and it doesn't affect your credit score. And hey, remember that Chime is also great for online checking and savings accounts, debit cards, and much more, all via a convenient phone app. Millions use and trust Chime with their money, and it's a great way to enter the adult world of finance. Get started at Chime.com sacred. That's C-H-I-M-E dot com slash S-A-C-R-E-D. Again, that's Chime.com slash sacred for your banking, credit, and other financial needs. The Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card is issued by Stride Bank N.A., pursuant to a license from Visa USA. 
Chime checking account and $200 qualifying direct deposit required to apply for the secured Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card. Regular on-time payment history can have a positive impact on your credit score. Impact the score may vary and some user score may not improve. All right, let's do what the next one is. Hell yeah, let's go people. <laughs> Just hold on everybody. Wait, hold your hold your applause. Hold your applause. Everyone, let's I want to hear a pin drop. Ready? Near Automata. <laughs> Thank you. Game of the year, 2017. Interesting. You know, I'm actually I'm not surprised Chris and I didn't vote for it, but I'm surprised the audience didn't vote for it. They, they seem to be... That's because... Uh, can I comment real quick? It was number 26 on the audience list. There you are. Just oh, to put wow. that out there. That hurts a little. That hurts just a little. I'm not so upset about seeing this on the list. Just Good. because I think it is an important PS4 game. Um, Dude, it's... wait. I'm the only... Oh. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm not going to vote for it. Does that surprise you, though? <laughs> no. Of course, yeah. The game is... It, the thing about Nier Automata is that if it wants to grab me in the beginning, it needs to be good. Like good in the beginning. In the good in the beginning, I mean. Not whatever it was in Colin, the Colin, we know you weren't several. talented enough to beat the beginning. <laughs> yeah, I'm not. We know. The Nier I'm fans not. know that Colin didn't I'm get not. I'm definitely not. I can, dude, okay. I'm like falling apart when it comes to games. <laughs> like, I just can't play anything anymore. But I'm, I'm not upset about this. I'm surprised, again, again, you and I have nothing to say about this. No. But this would be a game, like, that's a coin flip game for me. I think if you, if, yeah. you, if you knew someone that knew my taste, they would assume that I like Nier Automata, but it's just, I can't get into it. So, uh, speak to its finer points. Sure. So, Nier Automata, what makes I'll it the so good is it's a game that's about androids and robots, but it's not really. It's a game about you. And there's just so much to be said about this game, whether it's philosophical stuff, or the, I mean, the amazing soundtrack, no doubt. But man, and it sucks too, because I feel like this was the last good game that Platinum made. And uh, it sucks. I really hope they do another one, and uh, obviously the game before it as well. What's the philosophy behind this man? Oh yeah, uh, that's no, a robot. Oh, okay. So no, 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 Colin, Colin, yeah. listen, listen, listen. <laughs> that's a so robot. So that's a robot, yeah. and these are androids. Yeah. Very different. Yeah, very and they can't different. See. Yeah. All right. Well, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> I've said enough. Yeah. I, the thing about Platinum is that they are, um, I think, in a lot of trouble. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they go away, which is unfortunate. But it's because they uh, they bit the poison apple of the game as a service, and now they will suffer. Babylon's By the way, Babylon's Fall, Fall was below ten concurrent uh, players on Steam last week, so it's done. Does anyone want to speak about Nier? When it comes to Nier Autonomy, I only have two words that I can say, and that is Edwin Castillo. No, don't, no. Please stop. <laughs> that, that's the game you're praising, Dustin? The Edwin Castillo game? Why is this you... person a cult figure in our community? I don't understand. <laughs> because he, he is the game, it. Colin. What is, like, I don't, I have to know more about. No, you really don't. I think you're all right. <laughs> All right, enough of the weep shit. Let's go on. Shout out, Edwin. The Near King. Oh, yeah. This crowd got taste. Look I remember that. that day, September 1st, 2015. I remember it really well because Mad Max from Avalanche came out the same day. And it was a better game than this, in my opinion. Whoa. Come on. Boo. D Dagan and I will get to this one on Knockback, I think, uh, this year. As we work through, we did two and three, four come soon. So we'll get to this one eventually. Uh, I'm a no on this one, but I know that people appreciate and love this game. So, um, Chris, you didn't vote for it. Uh, it, was, it was my 26th. <laughs> it was so close. But, I, yeah, this is... Metal Gear Solid V is, is just one of those games where it's like, I feel like the sandbox is genuinely incredible. But it's just... that It's, it's disappointing in the sense that it could have been more than it ended up being. And I think it kind of holds itself back in that regard. Like, that story is like, I don't know what the fuck. Like, that, it was not a good story. And it's not necessarily Kojima's fault, but it's what we got, you know? So we got to judge it by what it is. And I just feel like it's a very, very strong sandbox, a very, very strong gameplay game, which is like the first time I could really say that for a Metal Gear game. 
Because like most Metal Gear is about like, you know, the, the atmosphere and the story and the characters and you know, there's some gameplay elements that kind of carry you through that, but your main drive is really the, the experience of it. And this is the first time that I've played a Metal Gear for the enjoyment of playing it. Just like moving through spaces and, and tackling things in, in my own ways. Because <laughs> Metal Gear advertises itself as like a stealth game. It's kind of not. It kind of is, but it's like it's more. It's more like this meandering anime story. <laughs> it you is more I mean? anime than people are willing to admit. But yeah. they should. It's not like Splinter Cell, which is like that's that you play that and you're like that's a that's a stealth game in a way that Metal Gear isn't. But you know, obviously, Metal Gear is a lot more long lasting. I was puzzled by this game, to be honest. It's one of those confusing things where I, I was like, this isn't Metal Gear. So why does everyone love it like it's Metal Gear? And I, I don't... I, I, playing like the first 90 minutes or so it was awesome. It was great. I loved the first 90 minutes. But then it goes into the missions, and I'm like, this just didn't feel right to me. And also, it's one of those games where like, you're spending a half an hour or 45 minutes like slowly going through the map and killing everyone and setting traps. And then someone sees you on like the, the 47th minute. And I'm like, I can't. I just can't do it. You know, I just can't do that over and over again, but I know a lot of people can. But you can tie a balloon to a man. You can. And then the man goes away. You can. <laughs> Dustin, what do you have to say about MGS5? So, I feel passionate about this game, but not passionate enough to stand up. Uh, <laughs> but, I think this game is awesome, and just like what Chris said, it's really all about the sandbox. And to me, I don't know, we all know that Kojima is a bit self-indulgent, but it kind of works. I always think about the intro to this game when um, Snake is like waking up in the hospital and the song, The Man Who Sold the World, there's like this awesome cover of it. And, it's like, and, and the whole scene where they're like trying to escape and stuff like that. I think this game is absolutely fantastic. I'm happy to see it on the list. And it's funny, Colin, because you always mention about how this game doesn't feel like a Metal Gear game. And I think that's half true, just because like Metal Gear games are like a progression of how their gameplay changed. And I feel like this makes sense coming from the previous games and how they became more open and more sandboxy. I mean, sure, it's not like Metal Gear Solid 1 at all, but it's like a nice gradient to it. Yeah, I think when, I, when Dagan and I go back to 4, which again, we'll do in the coming months, I think we'll get a better idea. Because 4 I kind of abandoned too, because it was just too much for my, again, my feeble brain. One thing I will else? say, yeah. That Kiefer Sutherland thing, I don't know if that was oh, necessary. Yeah. yeah. That, was that, that, kinda, that makes it feel less like a Metal Gear. Like if, I feel like if it was David Hayter in that role again. Shout out to David Hayter. Yeah. I mean, one, of the, one of the best, no doubt. Definitely. That was weird. It is, yeah. It's just one of those things that kind of pulls you out where you're like, oh, this is really close to being Metal Gear, but it's, it's a little bit off because that's the 24 man. Yeah. It's, well, it's that's classic true. Konami, like falling apart era Konami, right? Because yes. they're like, oh, we need an... You love Metal Gear? Um, we're going to just recast the protagonist uh, because he's a movie star. Yeah. Kind of. Uh, I thought that that was very weird, and now, of course, Konami ate shit. In fact, this was the game that cost them Kojima, but then he made Death Stranding, which was way better than this. All right. Oh. Anyone want to speak in defense of or against Metal Gear Solid V: The Phantom Pain? Uh, I'd like to return the conversation to Mad Max. Uh, to, to get health, you can eat dog food, you can eat maggots out of corpses, right. and the last boss was named Lord Scrotus. Right, that's right. Here's the thing about Mad Max, you guys never played it. It's not going to be on this list. Here's the thing about it, though, is that Avalanche, clearly they made an A-level open world game with nothing in it, right? Because they ran out of money and time, probably. And then they were like, but it's Mad Max. And for me, I was like, yeah, of course. That makes perfect sense. So I loved it. Yeah, it was awesome. All right, let's see what's next. Oh. All right. Yeah, this is good. Ratchet and Clank remake. Um, I'm a little surprised to see both of you not vote for this, but that's okay. Because I did. <laughs> I'd, I don't know, man. Ratchet and Clank... I, I know that you disagree with this, but I, I actually liked the new one more. Like, significantly. Like, to the point where it's like, I remember playing the first one and thinking, like, this is... And maybe this is, again, 
this is my frame rate snobbery. The last time I played it was when it was just <laughs> not optimized well at all. And it was like 30 frames, but it, like, it was kind of pretending to be 30 frames. It was like, oh, well, maybe sometimes we're 30 frames. And it's, it's just, it was kind of unplayable to me. And I just never got around to it, even though I knew they had that patch where that, that, that supposedly was remedied. Yeah, they put, they put that out right after I platinum. Oh, yeah, right after you beat it. So that was nice. <laughs> Damn. Um, yeah, this is, uh, I feel like this game was shocking when it came out. Not only how good it was, but I think it fixed the story, as I've said many times, of the original game, in which Ratchet and Clank don't really like each other. And that's awkward. So in this remake, they fix that. Um, I, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I don't know if that's fixing, though. Like, I think that's, like, a, a cool part of that. Like, I think it's... Whoa. Oh, okay, I have... All right. I, I just... I do, th I do think there was, like, an interesting element to that. Like, I do think, like, maybe they went overboard sometimes, or it just feels like... They, they, it feels like they, maybe they can't stand being around each other. But I did like that tension there, because it was something different than you would see in a lot of games that were kind of marketing themselves that way. Like, or even in the years prior, like... You know, there was no question as to whether or not Crash and Coco Bandicoot were close. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it was just like, hey, we're, yeah, we're related or something. And we're this fictional animal because it's in Australia and that's not a real place. And, <laughs> and I, I just feel like that dynamic is, is just fun. And uh, when they fixed it, I felt like they got rid of a lot of what made that series kind of interesting from a character interplay and, and character dynamic standpoint to the point where it was just like, oh, this is like, it's like a Pixar thing, you know? Fair Which I don't, know, I don't know if I like more. I'm sure it's more appealing, probably, to more people, but... I think the key thing about this game, too, was uh, $40, which I think was an awesome price point. Yeah. And explore that middle space. They need to do that more. Do you have anything to add, Dustin? You didn't vote for it, so... I think it's a great game. I just, again, this is one... I think I, so what I did when I was like making my list, I went to my physical game collection and I looked at some of the games that I had and this is not one that just jumped out at me, even though I think it is of like the highest quality. And it's funny because I feel like I remember so many more moments from the next game and I don't rem remember very much from this one at all. And it's not, it's weird because it's not like, a thing about its quality at all, but I don't know. It just didn't uh, didn't quite hit that way, I guess. Yeah, it's gorgeous, but I think from a gameplay standpoint, I just find it fine. Like it's good. Yeah. Like you know, it's good. There's nothing wrong with it, which is like I don't know. I don't know if that's like great praise. Yeah. It's not. It's not high praise for a game. <laughs> but I like Ratchet. Um, anyone want to speak in defense or against Ratchet and Clank remake? Ben is coming. There he is. <laughs> it's like winter is coming. Winter. Ben is coming. Whoa. Hand it down like a basket at Catholic Church. Ah, oh, we should have got those baskets. <laughs> How do you feel about the movie that was often overlooked? It's a companion. It was... Do you think Sony should revisit the well since they're kind of getting back into movies? Wasn't the movie kind of a failure? Yeah, it was. They, I, I remember that Sony PR actually invited us to see it and we were like, we're good. We don't really want to see it. <laughs> <laughs> but I do, I do think they want this to be a thing. I think Sly Cooper is going to come back too, but I think Ratchet's their, their go-to, along with Astrobot, which is going to, I think, be more relevant for them, for children. You know, it's good. Ratchet's good. Let's do the next game, though. Oh. Dang. Doom Eternal. So this, uh, I'm surprised, again, I, I, didn't even, I didn't beat it, although I liked it. <laughs> this is Spike just by being number two on your list, so I'll, I'll give you the floor, my friend. Doom Eternal. I look, man. I, I I can't. I think I've said Doom more in my life than I've probably like said Mom or <laughs> I love you or like any number of things. I've definitely said Doom more because these games are so damn good. 2016. It's so good. Like it's. It is the most kinetic first-person shooter experience that I think is available, period. I don't think, there's, I don't think there is a modern first-person shooter, shooter game that really encapsulates what was good about the genre at its inception, which was just this, this high-octane just rush through these 
intricate combat spaces. And the fact that they were able to successfully reboot this ancient series, and not only that, but make a sequel that was significantly better, is, is to me just genuinely impressive. Like how many, how many games do you know from like the early 90s are still kicking around right now? Like in ways that haven't, you know, like that they're, that they're the top of their genre or like arguably like incredible. Like there's very few, like and I, especially, especially in the FPS space where like, you know, <laughs> I'm not gonna say things that'll get me in trouble. But I think, I think just Doom Eternal is a very, very special game. I think it's so impressively designed. There are flaws with it, sure. I think, I think mainly it's not as cohesive as Doom 2016. There is like a teleporting angle that kind of sends you from one area to the other to the other. And there's not really a clear way of how you transition between those places other than just like you appear. But at the same time, who cares? Because the variety is there. There, there are first-person shooters out right now that have like, hey, you know, let's have, uh, let's have grass and trees, and that's it. That's all you're getting after six years of development. But Doom Eternal is just like a champion, man. Like, that is still just... It's also hard as hell. So, like, if you didn't beat it, I don't, I don't blame you, really. Like, it's, it's, it's a... It's hard, but it's, it's not surprising that it's not <laughs> number one for everybody. Yeah, this is, again, a, sh a sign of our disparate tastes. Shout out I to Mick Gordon also yes. for that soundtrack. Definitely. So, so I, I have a quick comment about Doom Eternal. And Colin, remember how a few weeks ago you mentioned on the show, like, what, what was it? Like, uh, nobody in the world has more job security than Dustin Furman, right? <laughs> I just want you to bring that, remember. Yeah. Doom Eternal should be played on PC, not on PlayStation. That's okay. I don't, you know, that doesn't upset me too much, but I think it's, first of all, I just got distracted because I was moving into my house when I think around the time, yeah, this game came out. That's so, like the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah, so um, I think that's the only reason I didn't end up beating it. But the thing about this game and, and Prey being on the list earlier is these are two games that we're, we're not going to get anything from these studios anymore on PlayStation. Um, so, oh, that's true. So it's, it's a shame. Id and I would argue Id and Machine Games are the best shooter studios that make games that I want to play. And uh, it's sad to see them go to Microsoft just for that reason if you're a PlayStation fan because we're going to miss those games like Wolfenstein and, and, and et cetera and so on. I do have to just say also the sound that when you pull out the one guy's eyeball and it sounds like a balloon going through a yeah. ring, it's like... Ten, that is that is worth it's shouting out. It's so cartoonishly out. violent. I love it. <laughs> like there's that one animation where you you like pop a guy's head and it like goes into his chest and it just looks so goofy. It's it's yeah. it's like one of the most violent things that you could possibly imagine. But because it's happening to this dumb goofy looking goober demon, it's just silly and fine. And I think they ride that line really well. I think that the resource management aspect of it is is tuned to perfection. It's just a it is one of the few games that comes clo as close to perfect as you can come in, as far as design goes. It's just such a good game. I'll say that playing Doom made me want Ghostwire Tokyo to be quicker when I was playing it. Yeah. Because th this game has a good, a nice feel. I like the kinetic feel. And I like games, and you, I know you're the same, I think you and I share this, in, in games that sometimes embrace that they're games. Yeah. Which, which Doom does. Uh, no pretenses. Yeah. But you're in hell, and... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, there's like floating, glowing health packs and shit. Yeah, it's, it's like, like Mars it's, it's, or something. Yeah. Do, do your thing. Uh, anyone want to speak in defense of Doom Eternal? Whoa. Whoa. This that, guy's passionate that right hand, here. That I, hand broke the sound barrier, dude. <laughs> I fucking love this game so much, I beat it on Nightmare at least 20 times. The DLC for this fucking game is extremely hard. The Ancient One Part 1, hard as shit. And Chris, I know you had trouble with the Marauder, but it's really fucking easy. Uh, he, he, like look, he compares look, it. No, look. no, 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 no. He, he, compare, he compares it to like a wasp. It's like all you have to do is use the gauze cannon. It's no, I a, understand that the. I understand the strategy that you have to employ to to do it well. 
It's just that that's not as fun as the rest of the game. I don't think it's necessarily that, especially now, like I've played it many times since then, and I, I agree, it's not really as hard as I thought it was initially, but I do still find that as competent as I, as I have come to be at the game, whenever I get to the Marauder, I do feel like, uh, I, like, I don't know, like I sigh a little bit because it's like, all right, the fun has to stop for a second. Because it's just like, I know how to beat it, but it's just not fun to do. Like I want to use my environment and shit. Uh, and my grapple hook that I'm so passionate about. Just like the one in Kingdom Hearts 4. It's not a grappling hook. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. All right, let's move on to the next game. Oh, yeah. Huh. Yeah. Oh, hell yeah. That's interesting. Dude, Chris, you put this at 16. Yeah. I don't even remember you talking about this game. Like, I didn't know you played it. Uh, yeah, I did. This was, well, this was, I think... I don't know why I didn't talk. I must have no, talked you, about I think it. you did talk about it. Probably, I, I probably just don't remember. You weren't on the show, I don't think, when it came out. Yeah, yeah. I was editing the show, though, so That's clearly true. I was I, somewhere. I think what happened was I played it, and then we, I talked a little bit about it, and then I fell off of it. But then I, like, I went back to it like a few months later, and then I, I finished it. But then by that point, I was like, am I going to talk about it again? Like, I, I think there were more important th games to talk about it at the time that I finished it. But yeah, dude, Don't Make Cry 5 is... is and I say this as somebody with very, very, like, staggeringly limited experience with Devil May Cry. It was just not, it was just not around me when I was growing up. I didn't play two or three. I played a little bit of, there was like a demo for four on, on the 360 marketplace that I played, like, endlessly. Um, but I didn't have money, so. But I, I think it's just a, a wonderful, wonderful example of, of third person, like, just stylish combat, and it, it's a game that just does not take itself seriously at all, and I, I, I do like that, because it does it in a way that's not, it's not like a Deadpool type thing. Sure. You know? I would say it's very anime, actually. It is very anime, yeah. 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 Which but, I have gone on record as saying, like, I don't mind it as long as it's not in that damn style mm. that makes me feel like I can't be caught watching or playing this. <laughs> You know, like it's it's why I, well, like the, it's why I enjoyed parts of Ghostwire Tokyo because like that's a very, that's very anime. But if somebody looks at it, they're like, oh, it's a contemporary. I video remember game. a game like that, uh, the first Bayonetta I bought yeah. when I was in ninth or tenth grade, and within the first hour, I was like, ah, this is going to be an awkward one to play in the living room. <laughs> but because yeah, she has okay. like guns in her boots. And yeah, that's yeah. fun. I, I would have never anticipated this game being on the list. So what, what do you have to say about it? Man. I, so thinking back many years ago, I played through all of the Assassin's Creed games in order to play three. I'm sorry. And guess what? It, I didn't enjoy the lead up and I didn't enjoy where I got and I haven't enjoyed it ever since. Sorry. But, Devil May Cry, this is one that I thought, I'm going to do a series playthrough. And it was worth it. Some of the earlier ones, if you haven't played them uh, when they were fresh, it's going to be difficult to go back to. But man, this game, it's, it's got everything. It's got, uh, you know, the crazy style, the combat is so good. Um, also, the song, Devil Trigger, amazing. Real, real good. I love this game. And it's one of those games that I always think I want to go back to. But when I have a lull, I never think of it. And then I'll start another game like, damn it, why didn't I think of Devil May Cry? Yeah. And now it, there's the PS5 version, too. That's true, yeah. It, it yeah. is one of those games. It's, like it's, it's fun to go back to. And I, <laughs> there's so many like, really iconic scenes just in that game. Like the, 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 the Michael Jackson <laughs> sequence where it's just like, what the fuck? What am I seeing? Like, and why is this here so late? Michael Jackson died like a century ago. Like what? <laughs> 2009 was a century ago, I think. Yeah, it has been a long time. I was remembering that it was 2008, 2009, something yeah. like that. Seems like a long time ago. I, I don't know, Devil May Cry, that came around this, uh, out around the same time Animusha came to PS2 back in the day. I feel like you chose one or the other at that time. And then I kind of just moved on with my life. So I never really got into Devil May Cry. Although it's interesting, Devil May Cry, of course, the original was supposed to be Resident Evil 4. And that's where it came from. All right, let's see the next one. I can barely even remember high school or college at this point, and there's certainly a number of reasons for that. But from what I can recall, Learning a foreign language was kind of a joke for virtually all of us. Whether you took French like me, or Spanish, or another language, chances are you retained very little, only studying for the next test, taking on some vocabulary and conjugation, and hoping for the best. It's this consistently poor experience so many of us shared as young people that makes Babbel so appealing as an adult. 
In short, Babbel is a language learning app, and you can learn more about it right now by going to babbel.com sacred. But if you'll allow me, let me sell you a little on what this thing can do. See, unlike our language adventures of old, Babbel's modern approach fits our active lifestyles and teaches foreign languages more effectively. With 15-minute lessons spanning 14 different languages, from German to Italian to Russian and beyond, Babbel encourages you to learn something, use it and understand it, and then and only then move on to what's next. You know, building a foundation and making sure it's sturdy. What makes Babbel truly sing, though, is that it's not AI-driven and AI-written like its competitors. Instead, more than 100 language experts helped craft Babbel's extensive suite of games, videos, stories, podcasts, and more. And you can even take live classes, use Babbel's voice recognition technology to work on your pronunciation and accent, and more if you're especially enterprising. I was personally taken aback by how easy and fun Babbel is to use. It's like the antithesis of my experiences all those years ago, from middle school to northeastern. It's easy to see why, using Babbel, millions of people around the world are grappling with languages they never imagined they can learn. But if I can, and they can, then you can. And Babbel and its bite-sized lessons are the key. And hey, you can always get your money back within 20 days of signing up if you're not completely satisfied. In other words, there's no risk. So let's give it a go, shall we? Right now, save up to 60% off your subscription when you go to babbel.com sacred. B-A-B-B-E-L dot com slash S-A-C-R-E-D. That's babbel.com slash sacred for up to 60% off your subscription. Babbel, language for life. Sacred Symbols is brought to you by Factor. It's finally starting to get warm out, and even though I do enjoy my extended time indoors, even I can't resist being outside. And Factor has been a huge part of that with having to spend less time at home, in the kitchen, and more time enjoying the springtime with no cooking, grocery shopping, and my least favorite, dishes. Plus, the perfect health-conscious grab-and-go add-ons like smoothies and juices. Luckily, I don't have to meal plan or prep, and I can still eat well now that I leave my meals to Factor. Factor makes it easy for me to eat clean 24-7 with fresh, never-frozen prepared meals that are so delicious, you wouldn't believe they're actually good for you. For me, it's totally easy to lose track of time, whether I'm recording a show or editing or working on the publishing. There's a lot that goes into our shows at Last Stand, and sometimes it can be as late as 8 or 9 p.m. before I'm getting to dinner. And I love Factor because I don't even have to think about it. Let's say you got a busy schedule for both lunch and dinner. No worries. Add an extra two, three, or even four meals to your order. Each Factor meal arrives pre-prepared and ready to eat in two minutes. Factor tackles the tough stuff, so I don't have to. Their registered dietitians and expert chefs work hand-in-hand to create meals with nutritious ingredients. Head to go.factor75.com sacred120 and use the code sacred120 to get $120 off. That's code sacred120 at go.factor75.com sacred120 for $120 off. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm surprised I didn't... I might have not... Re- nah, I don't know. No, I'm happy with my list. Although I think only three games that I voted for have been on this thing so far. I'll remind you that, I, that this was a show that was my idea. <laughs> uh, Tetris Effect. Really wonderful game. Really wonderful on PSVR as well. But also fun just by itself. Uh, Dustin, take it away. Sure. This is a game I'm passionate enough to stand up about. Yeah, so Tetris Effect, what is so good about this game? So Tetris Effect, of course, the name is based on this study that they did where about people that if they had them play Tetris for multiple hours, that they could see the Tetris pieces like in their mind's eye. And so they went with that as the whole concept of the game. And for anyone who's played this game, the soundtrack is probably like one of the best of all time ever. I own it on vinyl and listen to it regularly, you know, me, me, sitting there like a hipster listening to uh, my Tetris Effect vinyl. But uh, yeah, I absolutely love this game. And man, the VR mode, it's weird. It's like emotional. A Tetris game makes you feel something and you don't really know why, but you like it. And uh, that's, yeah, Tetris Effect is awesome. And Colin, I'm disappointed in you for not putting it on the list. Yeah, I mean, in looking at my list, I, I don't know. I, I don't feel like I would bump any of this for Tetris Effect. But I really did like it. I played it quite extensively. Chris, what do you have to say about it? I mean, I, I, just, I just think Tetris is a perfect video game by itself. Like, I, I don't think there is a more perfect video game than Tetris, like, sincerely. And I think it still has yet to be topped in, in any real way. And I, I think you can... 
there's a lot of gimmicks that people have tried to add to it, where it's like, oh, it's Tetris Battle. Or like, you know, just these other things. And it does make it better in some ways and, and worse in some ways. But I do feel like this is one of those games where it's like, oh, it's, not only is it th just this perfect game, but it's accompanied by this surreal experience that it has no business encompassing. Like it's, it, it would be like, it would be like if somebody made like a Monopoly movie and it was amazing. <laughs> and you're like, you're suddenly like really invested in the character of the Monopoly man. You're like, what the fuck? You walk out of the Monopoly theater crying along with everybody else. Like you just came out of Schindler's List. And like, that's what it's like. It, it's like, there's no reason for this game to be this um, emotional. There's no reason for this game to be this impactful because it's fucking Tetris. But it, it just is. And it's already, like I said, the, I mean, the design is perfect, I think. So it, it's got to be on a list somewhere. Well, it's Russian. We have to be very careful now. That's true. Uh, anyone want to speak out for Tetris Effect? Hey, real quick, while yeah. I'm walking to the next person, if you would indulge me for a minute, raise your hand if you're tired of the people around you having a little side chatter. Okay, lots of you, right? So shut up. Uh, <laughs> there, there, are, there, are, there are audience mics, and this is gonna go out to like probably 50,000 people. So just like, we can hear it. Um, be respectful, appreciate it. Lots of people paid for this, not just you, thanks. Ted Specs always a, Always a, a fine point from Ben. <laughs> <laughs> Tetris Effect is great, but I just want to say, like many things, Tetris is better on Vita. That's it. I think it was Tetris Ultra on Vita. Um, was there a Tetris game there, on Vita? There was a Tetris game on Vita. I know that the online was broken at the, the time Ubisoft that it came one. out. Oh, that's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, that one was ported to Vita. That's right. Yeah, that one was broken. That was one of the last things I did at IGN, actually, but that was the PS4 version. Yeah, it was totally busted. I forgot that. It would just crash my PS4 constantly. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, can we please get some great games on this list, for God's sake? Dude. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really curious. Ben, where's Ben? Are we going to see at the end the individual lists? Uh, I do not have that prepared. I could probably figure it out. No, no, no I'm, just curious, okay. I'm just curious. I, like, what did the audience vote for? <laughs> what did you vote for? You keep not showing up. I would expect this game to be voted for by the audience. Chris, of course, you're the Destiny master, so please. Yeah, man. Uh, I d <laughs> Destiny 2 has gone through quite a journey, to say the least. <laughs> you know, the, the, the nature of live service games really is, you know, there, there's, that, there's that Miyamoto quote that everybody likes to tote around, where it's like, oh, a delayed game, you know, is, is uh, I don't even remember it. Because it's just so, it's, it, doesn't even, it's not, it doesn't apply anymore. Because I think of Destiny 2, and I was like, oh yeah, that came out, and it was like really bad. And I couldn't stand it. And it pissed me off immensely. And it was just so unfun. And then years later, you come back to it, and you're like, oh, there's something here. And they're actually using this seasonal model that I, I kind of hate in most everything that I see it in. And they're using it to great effect, and they're using it to tell stories that are actually interesting with characters that have depth and, and actual growth and arcs. And it's like, this isn't a seasonal model. And I do think Destiny 2 has found this, found this quality over time. I don't think launch Destiny 2 finds its way onto any list, even remotely like this one. But the way that Bungie have really retooled this thing and really sold on a lot of the concepts that they were teasing in the original Destiny, which got like, you know, all sorts of development challenges and, and, and compromises. I just feel like the game right now, like this last expansion specifically, is so damn good for no reason because we've had so many years of terrible expansion after terrible, and even the good ones are like, ah, it's good for a Destiny game. You know, Forsaken was the one that everybody loved, and it was like, yeah, it's good, but it's, it's good in the context of the game. It's not like a game that you would like recommend to people. But The Witch Queen is like, I played through that, that campaign a couple times because it was just that enjoyable of an experience. And then on top of that, just 
the fact that they've managed to make Destiny hard, which it never really was. The raids are complicated because you have to coordinate with people. And that's frustrating because people don't listen. You don't listen, you people. <laughs> I know there are some of you. <laughs> Just and mathematically speaking, there must be. Yeah, statistically speaking, at least one of you does not know what the hell to do when you're supposed to. And I think just where it is right now is just in, in such a good place where I, I, I do think it is among the best shooter experiences that exist right now. There's a lot of caveats to that, and there's a lot of kind of pushing past certain things you have to do, but I kind of look at it in the same way that I look at, I look at Prey, where I, I played Prey years ago and hated it, and I played it now, and I kind of pushed past that, that degree of like understanding what an immersive sim was and... and now that I understand what I'm supposed to be getting out of it, I'm enjoying that game a lot more. And I think the same thing goes for this, this game. It's a live service shooter. It's not going to convert you, but it is unquestioningly the, the pinnacle of that genre. And I say that with absolute certainty. There's not a live service game that comes close, especially in the FPS space. Dustin, what say you? Destiny 2, man. It's, it, was, it was weird to rank this because I felt like ranking the first Destiny, but that felt weird no. to do just because it, it should have just been one game. Thanks, Activision, I guess. But, man, I feel like the thing for me with this is all about like the memories that I have from playing this game with people that you care about. Like I can think about that first Vault of Glass raid. It's like one of the best memories I've ever had playing a multiplayer game. And it's, uh, it's great to see that the game is just in a really good shape right now. I still need to get back to Witch Queen, but I, I think about it, like, daily. Like, I need to get back to that. But, uh, man, just one of, the, one of the best, no doubt. Speak out, ye, about Destiny 2. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I guess I've never played the game, so it's not a for or against type of thing, but I've heard Chris say multiple times on the show, like, I don't know if I'd recommend it, there's so much lore, all of this stuff, but now that the Witch Queen's come out, people are saying, this might be the time to get into it, so I need to hear, is it the time to get into it, or can I at least have like a five minute YouTube video of how do you get into Destiny later? Hold on, but, but... Thank you, Master Shredder. <laughs> <laughs> I would, I would not recommend watching YouTube videos of how to get back. They're, they're not good. <laughs> they're just not, it's, it's, they're going to tell you a lot of things that you don't need to know. I, I, I would say, look, Ben, if you really want to, now is the time to do it. I still would say, if you are in the, if, if you want to get the most out of it, it's going to be hard now because you'd have to play a lot. You'd have to review a lot. You're jumping into what is essentially like the seventh movie in like a big movie franchise without seeing the previous ones, a lot's probably going to be lost on you. But a good movie's a good movie. And I think that's kind of how I think about The Witch Queen, where like you can play that campaign and get a lot out of it. It is really well designed, it is really challenging. The legendary difficulty is, is tweaked to, to I think, as, as, close to, as, uh, as close to perfect as you can get with a, a, a game as you know, granularly customizable as, as Destiny with like different stats and different mods. And it's hard to balance RPGs like that. But I think it's just stellarly designed. I think the story is really good. I think the soundtrack is just, I mean, it's Bungie and they've never had a bad soundtrack. So I, I just think it's a really positive experience uh, if you choose to jump in now. You will be jumping in in a middle point. And as long as you understand that, I think there's a lot to gain from it. They should do a, uh, I don't know if they could, but I like those Bioware comics, like those digital comics that were when Mass Effect came to PlayStation 3 that kind of explained the story and maybe caught you up so you didn't have to invest that time if you didn't want to. But it's funny, I think about Destiny 2 all the time as well, like playing it, wanting to play it by myself, but I, don't, I just don't think that it would be uh, the Division-like experience that I would want it to be. All right. Please, God, let me see another game. Oh, okay, good. Very good. Very good. Now we're cooking. No Dustin for this one. Yeah, this is one, though, when I was putting my list out, I, I initially was writing games on Post-its. And uh, it was a game that I wrote down on a Post-it. But I, it didn't, a, didn't make the cut. That's a, uh, quite the uh, compliment. 
to the game. Mm, yeah. It made the post-it. It's funny because I think this game is, if anything, underrated. I think this game is extraordinarily good. It's complicated. Um, from a narrative standpoint, I don't quite understand how you even make a game like this. And I, I, I was, I've been impressed with that with Quantic since um, Heavy Rain, but I know a lot of people have been playing their games even before that. Uh, Nomad and those kinds of games. And I, I just, there's something about David Cage that just brings out this vitriol in people. I don't know why people don't like David Cage. I don't get it. Uh, and I say that as someone who has met David Cage and who David Cage has been a prick to me in person. <laughs> and I still like it, you know, I, I don't know if I ever told you, I went and played Beyond Two Souls at PlayStation HQ, and uh, we had previewed it and not given it glowing previews, and they had kind of, you know, they bring people in if you want to interview them, and they were like, uh, oh, do you have any questions for, you know, David? And I asked him a couple things, and then I'm like, all right, I don't need anything else. And then he's like, oh, I have a few things to say to you. And I was like, oh, good, oh, good. Um, and so they did these, these three games for PlayStation, and, um, I mean, I'll tell you that it was... They didn't, the two sides didn't like each other. They were eager to not be with each other anymore. Obviously, Quantic Dream is moving on, making a Star Wars game that's supposed to come out in like 17 years. <laughs> um, that looks, you know, uh, cool. But I, I like Detroit because it deals with prescient issues about technology and androids and things that we are going to deal with in the future. Like, it's coming. It's happening. It's going to happen. And uh, how in humanity interfaces with these robots and treats them and all that. A little heavy-handed sometimes. Um, you know, like the robots holding signs yeah, and getting, yeah. you know, going to protest and getting beat up or whatever. But they like link arms and stuff and sing. Yeah, <sighs> yeah but it's... Let's, no. From a, from a game design perspective, like, right. having just written the games that we've made and how much that took out of me, not that I'm a very spirited person, uh, I can't imagine writing this script where you have to lay it out like this and people die permanently, decisions are made permanently, you can't go back. The game does, I, mean, I love Quantic Dream, how they don't even reward you trophies until the, until the load screens, so you don't know what you did right and what you did wrong and all that. So what do you have to say about it? Yeah, I, I think, I, I'm, I come at it from the same angle that you come at it from, which, which is like, the work that it must have taken to write this thing in a coherent way is staggering. And like, I, I get mixed up just focusing on th just normal shit in my life. Like, oh shit, I forgot to, you know, I forgot to respond to that fucking email. Great. Like, I, I can't keep track of my own email, so to think of like somebody who's like, yeah, I've written 40 different arcs, <laughs> and they all resolve in like a, you know, in a way that's intentional. And some of them might not even be seen, you know, and, and like the majority of, pl the majority of people who go through this game are probably gonna go through it once. Yeah. That's like a lot of people. And not see most of it. Yeah, and, and you know, the, there's a lot of work that is not seen, and, it, and, and, and it's almost designed not to be seen, and I, I, I appreciate that. It's, you know, it's, it's part of what I appreciate about, or my newfound appreciation for things like Elden Ring, which is like, half, a lot of people aren't gonna find this shit. Like, a lot of people are just gonna meander through this and not know that this was here. And the, the commitment to the experience that you're making and the dedication to it to just dedicate so many resources to something that very likely will be not seen is just appreciated and I like I like the direction of it and I think it's I think it's a good looking game I think it's for its heavy handedness I think there's like a campy kind of quality to it uh, where I, it doesn't bother me as much as I think it would in in like uh, I, I don't know so, some of the some of the heavy handedness in this game if, if it was in like Red Dead I would be like ooh this is like this is the finesse is really really waning on, the, on this. But it, it kind of fits with David Cage. I don't know, he's just a strange person. He is. He, he's... And I appreciate that. I value that. I value strange people getting a lot of money and doing weird things with a, with a whole team behind them. I think that's what makes the most interesting shit. And uh, even if I didn't come away from Detroit Become Human thinking it was like the best experience or even necessarily you know, something that I would want to play again. I do think it's one of those things that I would recommend everybody play um, because it's just so strange and interesting. And it's one of those few games where, like, you could play that with a bunch of people, you know? Like, you could, you could play that with another person and it's just as enjoyable. Um, and it's, even if the other person isn't playing, they feel like they're, you know... It's a fun co-op game in a, in, a weird, in a weird way. Yeah, 
everyone's got to pay attention. I like how everything's kind of on a timer, though. So you, yeah, have, yeah. you have to kind of that's make true. decisions in the moment. Which but is, that's fun. It's like, oh, what, yeah, the, what, we, what, what was the answer? I agree. It's good stuff. Um, yeah. Anyone want to speak out about Detroit? It's fucking hard to see up here, isn't it? I know. <laughs> so I brought my glasses up here just in case. Oh, that's smart. So uh, just wanted to say, I thought that Detroit was a fantastic game. Um, you know, starting from the first scene where you have to save the little girl, um, you know, it just sucks you in emotionally. I personally, I played through the game both on PS4 and PS5, platted at both times. I probably played through like six or seven times. Um, so I got to see a lot of those hidden scenes that uh, maybe you didn't get to see before. Just one of those games, like you said, uh, if you haven't played it, couldn't recommend it more. I agree. And one of the things that I like that they did that they didn't do in Heavy Rain and Beyond Two Souls is show the butterfly effect uh, as it is, as opposed to making you guess. Oh, yeah. Which like was the, really the, annoying. The layout of, of the choice map. Yeah. Like, Very I remember cool. Heavy Rain... I platinumed it on PS3, and you had to beat it like seven times or something and do it in like this very specific order and then reload and go back to old saves and just so on and so forth. And it was just, that's the, um, that's me. Okay. Uh, let's see the next game. Oh, oh. yeah. Interesting. Sekiro. Uh, Dustin, speak. Yeah, so Sekiro is awesome. This is one of From Software's best games ever. In fact, I was just, as I said on the show last week, I've been going through and playing this game again just because in this game, purely, gameplay is king. And this game is special for me, I feel like, from playing through all the Dark Souls games again in the past year. This is the, I don't know, you want to say Black Sheep, but it's not because it's not, it's like it's like special, it's different from all the other ones in a really good way. It doesn't have leveling, it doesn't have uh, you know, any kind of stat stuff, you can't change your weapon. I mean, you can change the, um, you know, the different prosthetics and stuff like that, but this game was really different for From Software. And it's, it's crazy now, looking back to this game and thinking that they developed this on the side while working on 97 Elden Ring. <laughs> Just a little game on the side. Just a little game on the side. And it won. Game of the year. I mean, come on. So Sekiro is awesome. I'm super happy to see it up here. And Chris, you also like this game. No, yeah, I love Sekiro. I, the reason I didn't put it on my list is because I didn't actually finish it. That's fair. And yeah. I, I just I didn't feel comfortable doing that. Sure. But I do think it's an incredible, like, it, it's, it's one of those games where it's like, it's the one Souls game that I felt like I could, that was very approachable to me because it felt like it was operating under, like, really old game design principles. Where it was like, this is the game, this is what you can do, figure it out. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't this kind of, like, allocate stats to, you know, uh, testicle weight, you know, like, and, and that'll, like, give you, give you a key to the dungeon where the, it's, 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 it's a lot more streamlined and it's a lot simpler, but not to its detriment. I think it's still a very like challenging game and, and it rewards skill in a, in a way that I feel like is, is unique to From Software because it really asks you to just, it really asks you to play on its own terms. Right. You can't, you can't be like a mage and kamehameha like a, every enemy out of the sky. You know, you can't, you can't like have a, have a stealth build where like you're, you're Footsteps are like 10% quieter, you know? It's, right. It's, it's really like, no, the enemies will see you if you are in their cone of vision, and they always will, and there's nothing you can do about that except outmaneuver them. And you've got to master your parries, you've got to master your timing. You have this one sword through the whole game. Like, I, it's to the point, like, for in Elden Ring, I've just been using a katana, like, the whole time. Because it's just like, it, it, I just like that feeling of just playing Sekiro in a different game. It's, it's funny. I never thought about it being like a streamlined game, but I guess when you compare it to Dark Souls and Bloodborne, it, it, it is in that it's like there is one way to play this game. And that's actually initially why I didn't really like this game, is that I was trying to play it like it was Dark Souls yeah. or Bloodborne. And there's a point in this game where it's like, no, you can't do that. If you do not play it the way we intend, you will not succeed. Yeah, you're going to get stomped. It, it's like it's very NES. Like, it reminds me of, uh, like, games like Shadow of the Ninja, where, like, you'd play it, and you're like, there's, there's only one way to do this. 
you right. know, and, and I, I have to either get good enough at doing it in the way that he wants me to do it, or I just don't do it, you know, and I like that in, in, in Sekiro, and, and also just like the aesthetic of it is a lot more appealing to me than, I, I, I don't know, like, like fantasy castle thing, I, f I feel like I've seen it like a million times, it's, it's not like I won't play a game that has those elements, but there was something interesting about, you know, grappling hook ninja in Japan. You know, it, it felt like a Tenchu game, which I think is... Yeah, FromSoft Hat was, was involved with those um, after Acquire. Yeah, and I don't know, that aesthetic is just so fun, and that, and that enemy design is so, so interesting, and especially like that guy that, that comes out of the sky and howls at you. Oh, yeah, the guy on the, uh, the kite. <laughs> yeah. He's a fun guy. I like it. You can, you can go and, like, sneak and cut it, and you just hear him, like... Yeah, on the distance, ah! like, yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> Did, have they said that they're going to revisit this? Or They have not said anything about um, revisiting it. I know a lot of people think, like, oh, well, they're going to have to go back to Activision, but to my understanding, they own this IP, so they can yeah, take do, it do wherever they, they want, which is really interesting that that was their deal with Activision. Yeah, that deal's becoming increasingly common. That's what, obviously, Insomniac and Microsoft did back in the day, and I don't know. Uh, anyone want to speak about Sekiro? Game's way too hard for me to play. <laughs> hey, man, that's too hard for me, too. But I love it. I played it, I think, for like five seconds. I was like, I just can't do this. All right, so random question, aside from Sekiro, about trophy data. So you mentioned a few weeks ago that you were fascinated by the trophy data of Elden Ring and how the platinum percentage was so high in relation to common completion, such as, like, first boss, right? And so I recently just revisited Sekiro after Elden Ring, and I found that the platinum was damn near 10% in Sekiro, which is a game that is not easy to play, as you mentioned. So what do we think it is as a community? Sekiro, great game, by the way. Loved it. I think the gameplay is From's best, easily. Just the raw gameplay, when you understand it and come to terms with it. So what do we think it is as a gaming community about the pride people have in platinuming From games, because they clearly get their hooks into people? And are they really as hard as people make them out to be a From game? Or what is it with the badge of honor? I mean, I, I just want to say as far as cause with Elden Ring, I can say from my perspective, yeah, the games are as hard as I think people say they are. Like, I just really don't have the patience for these games. I don't know why. I just, I can see it and I understand this hook where you want to, like, beat the boss or you want to get a little further because you know there's something interesting on the other side. Like in Elden Ring, when you basically just run past that first boss, like, and, and that's, like, what you're supposed to do. Oh, the, the tree sentinel? Yeah, the tree no, sentinel. not the tree sentinel, but the, the other, there is that. But there's like one where you're in that valley and everyone's like shooting at you. And, and I, I told oh. you, I just ran through Oh, and the giant it. comes down? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And I like that kind of stuff, but I think you're right. I think that's exactly it, which is that people have a real pride in platinuming these games, which I think speaks to the high number. And I think it's hysterical that like I have the Horizon Forbidden West Platinum and the Far Cry 6 Platinum and the Ghostwire Tokyo Platinum, and those are all more rare than the Elden Ring Platinum, which makes no sense. <laughs> and um, yeah, I think it says a lot about the way people like to play those games. Yeah. All right, let's see what the next game is. Oh. All right, so similar, uh, I said, I told a story recently and I'll, I'll give it up to the people that want to talk about the game. I think I've kind of admitted recently that I rushed through Uncharted 4 when it came out. Uh, because I was that kind of funny at the time. We always tried to hit embargoes, and I remember people like breathing down my neck, like, we gotta do the spoiler cast. So I kind of, by the end of it, when you, oh, I don't wanna say what happens at the end, but what, I was like, I can't, I don't care about this game anymore. So I don't feel like I really have given it a fair shake. So I more feel like I've abstained from this vote than anything else. Uh, but I'll let others speak to it. Dustin, you wanna? Take sure. It away? Yeah, I mean, this game was so impressive as Naughty Dog's first, I mean, it's their first real outing on PS4. We, they did the uh, Last of Us Remastered, of course. But what I love about this game is its overall theme more than anything. And of course, there's this like the iconic moment, I feel like, that a lot of people talk about this game is the scene where uh, Nathan Drake is in his attic and he's looking at the things from his past adventures. And there's the scene where he has like the Nerf gun and stuff like that. And I just love this idea of like Nathan Drake a few years later and like wanting to recapture what was clearly the best time of his life and what that costs him, uh, not only those times before, but 
what that costs for him, what that costs for his marriage, and his relationship with his brother, of course, is a big element. And it just, coming from Uncharted 1, 2, and 3, which I think are all fantastic games, and I think we were, we were the talking about this on the Hot Take episode that come, came out today, mm. but those are like pulpy Indiana Jones style. I mean, of course, there's heartfelt moments, but they don't necessarily have deeper overarching themes as like the main thing. And so, man, I, I think this game is really special for taking something that really didn't deserve, I don't want to say didn't deserve that level, but perfectly taking it up just like one more level. Uh, I think for me, one of the interesting things about this game, it might be Naughty Dog's most impressive game simply because they took what existed when Amy Hennig was there and then they reworked it all into a new story and made everything work. As I've said in the past, I was at Naughty Dog, I saw the entire layout on Amy Hennig's wall of exactly what the Herc version of the game was. And those maps and those different things are just in Uncharted 4 now in different order. And so you can tell that, you know, they took the assets, they took the story, they're like, we have all the mocap, we have all the acting done, we have this and that, we can't throw it away, we need to mix up a story. And they made something that seemed cohesive and um, it wasn't a game that they necessarily, that team necessarily wanted to make. So that's an impressive thing for me. Do you have anything to say? Yeah, I mean, it's got a grappling hook. It does. And by the way, I'll say that one thing I remember about that is the grappling hook and the sliding. Yeah, yeah. They just kept using that over and over again. I'm like, they we did. get it. Yeah, they did. They Dude, how does Nathan Drake not have a hole in the butt of his jeans? He's constantly, like, he sees rocks and he's like, I gotta slide, like, instantly. They, Every time. You could just tell that, like, they made that work. Yeah, yeah. And they're yeah. like, we gotta get this thing in yeah, there. Just, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's weird, too, because it's like, that... <laughs> Naughty Dog finds a way to make things work that kind of like that are very difficult, and then they they kind of don't use it. It's like in The Last of Us Two with the rope. The rope. I was about where to I'm say like, that. wow, this is really impressive, and then they used it like twice. I'm like, what the fuck? But it's a good rope. There's like this is millions of dollars of R and D on this damn rope, and you're gonna use it like twice for like really mundane like easy puzzles. But I think Uncharted Four is is it's one of those games where I'm not huge on the formula of of, you know, third person, you know, very narrative heavy kind of like, oh, the Tomb Raider type thing. But I loved Uncharted 2, and I, I thought Uncharted 3 was really good, and, and one I, I played kind of recently, and I actually thought, oh, this, this is pretty solid. And 4, I think, is my favorite, because, I mean, that grappling is pretty cool. But it's also got Crash Bandicoot in it. Dude, that's right. That's true. I really, I loved that. Which was awesome. Yeah, that, that was, was just really like one of those things where I was like, this is kind of amazing that this is happening. Because it feels like the original ROM. <laughs> like it feels, re it doesn't feel like they recreated it, you know? Which is weird. Because it was probably in well, all likelihood. You, dude, in the, in the PS5 version, I'm pretty sure it runs at 60. Oh my like God. Like the crash segment runs at 60. I was like, that is weird, but cool. That's really bizarre. Yeah. I, I will say this about Uncharted 4 that I felt at the time, and I think I still feel, is that I personally think that the game does set up another Uncharted game. And, oh, yeah. Um, I, I am eager for them to do that. And I think actually, by, and I don't want to spoil it, but I think by waiting this amount of time, they've made it make sense about how this particular character might grow up. So, yeah. Um, what if the next game features Nathan Drake, but it's Tom Holland's face. That, they're going to pull some shit like that. I'm surprised when they released it on PS5 earlier this year that they didn't... Because didn't they change Spider-Man? Not to... not, But they... they ch yeah, they changed him. To, and not to look like Tom Holland, I, I don't think. I think that's the conspiracy, but, like, I mean, that, that guy probably just looks kind of like Tom Holland. I, th I think... The rumor was that the, the original guy wanted more money to appear in the sequel or something. Oh, and they were like, well, fuck you, we're going to replace you. You're Peter Parker. You're the most replaceable person on the face of the earth. You know how many times we've done this? That was a bad strategy on that guy's part. Like, you just take the money and run, man. Yeah. There's been like eight Spider-Man, there's been like eight Spider-Man in the last like five years, it feels like. So like, I mean, just, you know, count your, count your blessings. Yeah, you I agree with that. Who wants to speak about Uncharted 4? Oh wow, that's a decent amount. Oh, I was wondering, uh, if they, when they make a sequel, would you be satisfied if the like Naughty Dog's formula didn't evolve past what they do here? Like, it's still great, but kind of the same setup in terms of like, uh, how their games work? Yeah, I, I, one of the things I liked about Uncharted 4, except for the, the, the little conversation decisions that they put in there, which I thought was weird, yeah. um, 
although they didn't really matter, is that they re resisted this inevitable urge that I'm sure they got in play testing and focus testing where it's like, why can't I upgrade my pistol? And why can't I have a side quest in this map? And then they were just, they've always kind of stayed true to that. I hope that if they do make this un Uncharted game, I think it's gonna come from outside of Naughty Dog. Hopefully they realize that that is the formula that they need to stick with, is to like show restraint, because it lets the character shine, and the gameplay is kind of secondary, which I think is okay. Yeah. All right, let's see what the next game is. Yeah. Persona, four, uh, Persona 5, Royal. Listen, Chris has not been passionate to stand up once during this whole thing, and then he falls down. Unbelievable. I'm not, I'm not surprised by this at all. It's specifically the Royal version, I guess, that we voted for. We condensed it, so there was only Royal. Oh, okay, cool. We didn't want to split the vote. No, I, I totally understand that. So I would, I would typically make fun of this, but as listeners know, I, will. Um, I really ate up Persona 4 like within the last six months. I stopped right at the very end because I realized that I messed up the social link trophy and I still haven't gotten over it. I, 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 ask Micah, it was like, I, I, I had like fucking tomes in our bed when I was playing this game, like trying to cross everything off and like careful, I gotta go see the fox and I gotta go do the favor for the fox. And it's, oh my God, it's raining. I gotta go and fish and all this. And then somehow, so that was really dispiriting. Yeah, I would yeah. imagine. Um, so, this is a game that I want to play at some point, but I think I liked your theory on uh, Sacred that Persona 3 will come to PS4 this year, which I think will happen. And I feel like that would be, f I kind of want to play that first. I feel like the more I go forward, the more uh, hesitant I'm going to be going backwards, and I think that will hurt me with this. So, I have no problem with this game, but I've said enough. Speak. Weebs Raz up. Persona 5, I mean, come on, guys. Everyone knows. Everybody knows. Colin knows. Chris, you fucking know it. Don't actually rise. Number 11. So, man, Persona 5, and particularly Persona 5 Royal, I mean, Look at that box. just took everything about the original, any kind of complaints, anything, and just made it amazing. It made it perfect. And there was a lot riding on this game in that we have Atlas, who's coming off of that team, who was making uh, made Catherine, and of course the immaculate Persona 4 Golden. And there's a lot of pressure, especially coming from Persona 4, which is like this kind of fun, Scooby-Doo, JoJo's Adventure, Part 4 uh, Adventure. And they really went different with it. And I think I saw an interview that one of the creators said, like, we didn't know how people would feel about this whole thieves aspect of it. And it's funny, because I feel like that's like, the best aspect about this game is the, the Phantom Thieves and this, this idea of like sticking it to the man, right? Like Persona 4 is so happy-go-lucky. The colors are bright and blue, beautiful. The music. And the music, the, dude, the pop, you know, the super poppy music. Dude, I can't believe how much I love the Persona 4 soundtrack. It's embarrassing. I'm dude. like working out every day listening to that thing. Like, You're like, signs of love. Yeah, oh my God, that yeah. song. In fact, yeah. there's a, in, our, in the Herboxia 2 port on... Uh, PS5, I named one of the trophies Signs of Love after. That's, dude, yeah, excellent. So, yeah, I mean, Persona 5, I'm just, I'm so happy this game resonated with so many people and that it, I mean, it's clearly now like a mainstay. People are talking about Persona 6 constantly, consistently. That will, be the, that will be the culmination of this Persona celebration, right, that they're doing now is the, the arrival, or the re reveal of the game? Right. That does seem to be, because they keep, like, showing the lineup of all the characters, and then it's like, what's, what's next? What's the next person? And, or, you know, what the next, uh, maybe the next waifu? Maybe? Yeah, who, maybe. Could the, who could that be? And, and the animal, too, right? They're going to have, like, an animal of some sort, probably, because they, they have, like, a cat in this one. So, like, yeah, there's the cat, and then there's and then Teddy. Teddy. And Which then, is, I don't know what that was all about, but that was interesting. He, what was going on with him? Never mind. Lord. We got to do a spoiler cast for that game. Uh, we, we'll do that. Listen, yeah. any time. And we got to get Maddie on there as well. Yeah, Shout yeah. out. Shout out to Defining Duke, yeah, by yeah, the way. Yeah, yeah, We haven't mentioned them at all yet. Shout out to those boys. Yeah. We'll do it. I, here's the thing, though, Colin, is mm. I feel like, you know, this has kind of become part of my brand and stuff, so I got to replay through all of Persona 4. And that's like a big, big commitment. That but is a big I commitment. am pumped. 
But, dude, it's got to be on the PS4 because of the Metacritic draft. That's true. It's That's got right. to be on PS4. Which I'm winning, by the way. Right now. Yeah. Well, it's your cross to bear, Dustin. Yeah. <laughs> Who wants to speak about Persona 5? <laughs> love the game. Love how twisted it was. The first dungeon, there's... It's about the guy who has inappropriate relationships with high school girls and there's giant penis monsters and everything. Um, oh, hell yeah. <laughs> but I add to the penis monster, not the underage girl. Thing. Let's like, be clear. Yeah. Let's be exactly. clear. Yeah. <laughs> stand way down. Yeah, stand down. We're not in Japan. Stand down. But I don't know if it happened to anybody else, but I was so into the game and when I inadvertently chose Lady On as my... Waifu, I had to replay, I willingly replayed like four or five hours of the game to reload my save and go back and pick the right one. Mm. That's important and that's a fantastic choice, no I, doubt. I, you know what was made me mad about Persona 4 was I followed that guide and it had me pick Chie, which, is, which was disappointing. But I did it just because that's what I had to do for the guide. There's some passionate anti-Chie Chie, waifu out there. I don't, <laughs> You treat the guide like it's a fucking Bible. Like you, you, have it like, you have it opened by your bedside. You just read it to fall asleep to feel nice about the state of the world. Yeah. Well, trust me, I don't feel nice about anything. <laughs> Let's see what the next game is. Yeah. Yes. Very good. So have we had one yet that everyone has voted for? No. I don't think so. I don't think so. I'm surprised you didn't, you didn't like Control. It's fine. Oh. It's, uh, it's, I feel like the ending of this game kind of, I don't want to say it ruined it for me. Um, I just, man, honestly, all of the reading constantly to just know anything going on. It's like, hey, read this book real quick. And all, I liked the, I know they did it in Quantum Break, although I didn't play it. Which I the live the, action? Yeah, I loved the live oh, action yeah. stuff. I thought it was super cool. I, dude. You and I, because I lived in California at the time, you and I really bonded over this game. Like, the, the, I really, really, really love Control. I think this game was shockingly good. I'm not a Remedy fan. Actually, I said, is it, yeah, I noticed for the first time a few weeks ago that the Remedy logo is a... I'm not a Max Payne guy. I'm not an Alan Wake guy. And of course, I kind of felt like Alan Wake just took forever to make, and I was, they were mysterious and strange. And then this game came out, and I thought it was awesome. And I loved it. I, I, I totally understand what you're saying, because it's a lot. But I loved when we did the spoiler cast, just reading all of this shit and, being, and not really understanding it, and, and being pretty excited about the fact that they're doing a sequel. And hey, they danced with, with the one that brought them, too. They're doing it with 505, which I think is cool, even though they definitely don't have to anymore. And so I, I like that, too. So they seem like they're responsible. Yeah, it's 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 such a wonderful experience. Like I, I've always been a big fan of telekinesis in in video games. There's just something about it. Ever since like Destroy All Humans, and, and uh, there was that uh, there was that um, Star Wars, Force Unleashed. I think it was. Was it? Uh, there was a force a game called The Force Unleashed, but I, I, yeah, yeah, I with the telekinesis yeah. and like the. I just feel when like when you played as like the Sith dude. Like, yeah, 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 yeah. But like just moving moving shit with your mind in a game can be very very satisfying, and it's. I feel like a lot of games try and they don't really get it right, uh, but Control really like nailed the feeling of impact and, and just the, the, the feeling of, of becoming insanely powerful and, and just this weird like liminal kind of office building that just sort of like shifts and shit. There's specifically the ashtray maze is, is just this one sequence that I, I still think about because it's just so interesting from a design perspective and, and, and the fact that they have this music blaring, it's so remedy and it's so uncompromising. It's so, such an uncompromising um, display of the personality of that studio and, and even just something with, even with the characters and that, that janitor who's speaking yeah. in all this cryptic Finnish weird stuff that you don't really see a lot. Like, like what the hell, Finn? I, I, I can't remember the last time I thought about Finland ever. Yeah. You know? Sam Lake. Yeah, but like that character is so interesting, and he speaks in such a weird way that I've never seen before, and it, and, and it just captivated me, and, and and just the idea that like these these enemies were like fridges and like microwaves and stuff, just like it's so weird 
And I, I love Remedy's commitment to just being as strange as possible. Even when they're doing something straightforward like, like Max Payne or, 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 or Quantum Break or, or Alan Wake, where there's always this, this uncompromising personality that, that permeates through the entire thing, that even when you're playing something like Quantum Break and largely it's fine, you can't help but feel like this is so bizarre that this exists. And I love Control, and I'm excited for the premise of more of it. Uh, I, I still have to get to the DLC, which I hear ties into Alan Wake, and I'm, I'm, ex I'm stoked to get, get to that in my back catalog. But Control is, is a very special game, and I, I recommend it very, very highly. Yeah, I agree. It's very well made. Uh, similar to Resident Evil, I liked how the, a character was like the, the skyscraper. In yeah, the yeah. And like climbing up it and going around it. I also like government stuff, but not... It's like deep government where like most people in the government wouldn't know that they're doing any of this weird shit and all that. And it was very strange. I, I, I dug it. And I like Sam Lake's obsession with the United States. It reminds me a lot of uh, what we were saying with David Cage, where he always makes his games in the US. There's something interesting about a foreigner, a foreign writer who loves, he doesn't want to sound like he's finished. That's why he calls himself Sam Lake. And he just is like, I love, I love this shit. And it's cool to see an outsider's perspective on our own society, even though it's, of course, all made up. Does anyone want to speak about Remedy's wonderful game, Control? That one? Wow. Damn. That's okay. Oh, under, we, under we, have, we have, we have a, a couple takers up here. Uh, I don't, ben, you're getting a good workout today, my friend. I'm sorry about that. I would say Control is like amazing, and it does a great job of um, enhancing the Alan Wake experience if you care about Alan Wake. There's such great lore built into uh, Control, and if you spend the time to really like dig into it, as you're playing through the game, you'll find more things about Alan Wake that you love, and you just get more excited for Alan Wake 2. And yeah. I think that's what Control does really well. Um, it envelops you in the world that uh, Remedy puts together for you over the course of a decade and a half or so. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's, it, what's good about it, too, is it, is it doesn't feel like an Alan Wake prequel game. You know, it feels like it's, it very much like its own thing, but it just feels like... I, I, I remember playing it the first time and being like, I don't, I don't know if this is in... Alan Wake's universe or not. I heard rumors about it, and then that, that DLC obviously confirmed it, but that's extra exciting. And I, I love that kind of stuff. Yeah, and, and even just like something as simple as like naming conventions for things, like the, the oldest house. It's such a weird name for this place, and I, I, it controls so good. I agree. That awesome. old Gods of Asgard song, is <laughs> it's on my Spotify playlist now. I'm looking at... Uh, I just wanted to look up to make sure I got them all. The one concern I have about Remedy moving forward is just too many games. Yeah. Um, Alan Wake 2 with Epic, Control sequel, and that game Condor, Project Condor, both with 505. They're remaking Max Payne and Max Payne 2 with Rockstar. Mac 3. And, and they're doing Vanguard with, with Tencent. Yeah. <laughs> really? Vanguard? Yeah. yeah. There, there's that? a game called Van Project Vanguard. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. No, not. Yeah, I was about to say. And they're the doing fun? that with Tencent, so... Um, yeah. I don't know. That's a little concerning, but I think having different producers and different funding sources will keep them honest. We'll find out what happens. Uh, let's see the next game. Resident Evil 2 Remake. Yeah, good. Um, oh, look at that. It's relatively evenly d divided, too. Yeah, again, no, no dust in here. Sorry. No, that's okay. I'm s um, this game is uh, absolutely phenomenal. I... I I don't have a, a, a soft spot for Resident, like Resident Evil 1 and 2 as much as I think a lot of people do. I remember playing them. In fact, Resident Evil was the first game on PS1 I ever played. But um, when Remake came to GameCube, I think that was in 2002 or 2003, that was when it really kind of started getting me focused on these games. And these other games, 2 and 3 and 4, have been begging for remakes ever since. And so, I don't know. I, I find Resident Evil 2 totally compelling. I, I, I love the the somewhat limited claustrophobia of it, and different characters, different ways through. Um, this is a game that absolutely belongs on the list, I think. How do you, how do you feel about it? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 feel, I felt weird putting it on the list at first because I was like, oh, it's a, it's a remake, you know? And I, I don't, I don't, that shouldn't disqualify anything, but I always, I always feel like, well, this is technically like something that's been done before. But the more you look at Resident Evil 2 Remake and compare it to the original, it's... it's it doesn't feel like a remake. It's its own thing. It's offering like a completely different experience from the original, but it's still so faithful to it. And just getting to learn the layout of, of the police department and, and, and just going through it and then have that, that presence of Mr. X constantly like looming and it feels real 
in that way where you can hear him. I, I think I, there was even like a YouTube video, I think, it was, I think it was Boundary Break or something, where they, they showed that he actually does exist like as you're kind of going through the house and he actually does have a path and he doesn't like spawn out of nowhere to right. freak you out. And that, just something like as simple as that is just so cool. Yeah. Just it, to know that you, if, you, if you listened close enough, you could, you could see him coming. And uh, it's just such a good experience. It's a tight experience, too. It doesn't overstay its welcome. It's not this m meandering, like, 40-hour mess that, like, just drags you along, and you're just like, oh, man, I wish, I wish this ended, like, half, like half the runtime ago. It's just it's such a well-designed, well-crafted, tight experience that I find, honestly, like, really replayable. Like, it's, it's a really replayable game, uh, which is saying something for how, you know, theoretically linear it is, um, just absolutely belongs on the list. Resident Evil 2 is fantastic. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Any reason you didn't want to put it on the list? I've actually never finished this game. I've started it twice, and I think the last time I had started it with a friend, and we were like, oh yeah, we'll, we'll get back to this. And then it just never <laughs> happened. And I've actually really enjoyed everything I've played of this game, and uh, it's, it's like Devil May Cry. Um, yeah. Uh, just like you never think of going back to it and so but now they're doing that ps5 version so it's like i feel like now i just gotta wait and play that like no doubt so when is that when are those coming out i have no idea Pretty, june? june oh that's no time at all so no. i probably will be, probably come yeah. out the same day that that perils of bacon comes out so distract everyone it's gonna be awesome um I like Resident Evil 2. I think it's important, as I keep saying on the show as well, to keep games in the best possible condition that they can be in as we move forward, since these networks will now be ubiquitous. So let's have the best version of Resident Evil 2 that we can, and that's the remake of the game. It makes me excited for Resident Evil 4 remake, although I fear that they might push it too far. We'll see. Resident Evil 3 remake was really good, too. I just don't think Resident Evil 3 is as good of a game, so I don't think it, it matters. But that was a pretty true remake, too. Uh, does anyone want to speak about RE2 remake before we move on? I like the cheeseburger graphics in the beginning. When it zooms oh, in yeah. on that guy eating the cheeseburger yeah. and you're just like, look at I, that. Uh, <laughs> there's a, kind of a trend I've noticed in some of these games where, especially like Tetris Effect and um, uh, Doom Eternal with their soundtracks and their sound and being kind of an iconic part of a game. And a game like this, the, the Mr. X footsteps slowly coming towards you as you're in a room and Mr. X is not. and just the way that that tracks as he gets closer and closer, that's like in all time memory for me with this game. It's intris intrinsically tied to the experience and for a whole new generation of people to experience that is awesome. Yeah, no doubt. Like sound, sound is arguably half the experience with anything, like especially with like a, you know, film, TV and, and, and video games. I think it's like, it's, it's a large part of the experience. You could argue that there's a lot of games that are carried by their, their soundtracks in, in a lot of cases and I, I think, uh, or their sound design, and I, I think Resident Evil 2 is, is, does a fantastic job of that. The the way that, in particular, the, the, with those Mr. X foot, and Mr. X in general is just such a fantastic, just gameplay device, because that game builds. You spend so much time in that game building up this idea of like, oh, this is the safe part. This is the safe part of the mansion, where like, if I want to confront the zombies or whatever, I gotta go into that hallway. And once I get in here, it's fine. And then that goes right out the door. It like plays so perfectly with your expectations of what a video game is, and so like there's like a subversive attitude towards it, and I, I it's it's so good. You should play it if you haven't. Somehow. Yeah, it's it's uh, I like the imminence in the game. It reminds me a little bit of Majora's Mask, mm -hmm. and just that you can't really sit still. Yeah, at some point in the game, you kind of have to move, um, or you're gonna die. So uh, let's see as we get into the number nine here, right? Let's move on. Hey, Colin, you asked me to keep you on track with time. Just yeah, let you know, you, you got about an hour. You're good. Are we, our, our pace, our cadence is... You're great. ...is appropriate? You're great. Excellent. All right, so I think I probably would have voted for Bloodborne, but I didn't beat it. Same. Uh, so I, I didn't bleed, I played it extensively, but I, I just didn't beat the game, so I couldn't vote for it. I just felt like that would have been... Wrong, but I have no problem with this game being in the top 10. This is an iconic PlayStation game. Um, you haven't seen The Last of Bloodborne, I'll tell you that. Uh, what, do you have to, what do you have to say about, about this? Well, Bloodborne was my number one game here, of course. Yeah, yeah, 
Shout out to Bloodborne. This game is the game that made me uh, the Souls freak that I am now. And it, I, I think I've talked about this on the show, but I'm going to tell you guys again anyway. <laughs> I, played, I played Dark Souls 1, I played Dark Souls 2, but I never could get into them. I never could finish it. Like, I just didn't, something in my mind didn't click. Eventually, I'd get to a point that was too hard, or I didn't know where to go, or something like that. And something changed with Bloodborne. And it's hard to put my finger exactly on why. I guess maybe it's just that, like, the way they switched from the, like, more, like, methodical and slow, deliberate combat of Dark Souls into something much more fast pace and the the system of where when you get hit you got to be extra aggressive and go in in order to regain that health is something that i'm surprised that more games haven't copied because i love that idea it's like you get hit your instant gut reaction is to step back but bloodborne says no go back and get that health take a step forward and and man we didn't even talk about yarnum yet this the setting this is what we were saying earlier about the, the location is probably, honestly, what is at the core of this game. Yarnum, this city that has just been completely screwed up. And when you start this game, you have no idea why. What's going on? There's like a, there's a dog with a bird's head. What's going on with that? So, what are and, you doing, Miyazaki? Yeah. What's, what's the deal with that? Yeah, and so this, the ga this game was just such a a transcendent experience for me where it's like I beat it and then I was like I'm gonna I have to play that again right now and then it's like oh now I'm on new game plus four and I'm sure a lot of my Souls fans out here know that feeling of just like okay let's see, let's see if I can beat this in three hours now once you've got like your, your stats built up and stuff like that and so man Bloodborne is just uh, such a special game and truly one of the best PS4 exclusives and uh it's just evidence, Colin, of something that you always say about how Sony, they let From Software get away. Yeah, they definitely did. I mean, Bloodborne was definitely a, a restitution for the letting Demon Souls get away. Sony had no idea what they had with Demon Souls. And to be fair, as I've said many times, none of us had any idea that Demon Souls was going to be any good. But Bloodborne came out around the time we left IGN to go do Kind of Funny. And I had not really played it too much. It was kind of beating my ass. And then... When I moved to L.A., when I founded Colin's Last Stand, that's when I played. Like, I kind of walked away from games, as people remember, for about six months, and I came back, and that was one of the first games, if you look at my trophies, that I sat down and played. And I, I extensively played it now. Because of my lack of skill in these games, I've spent 50 hours or something with it that maybe a normal FromSoft fan would have spent 30 or something. But I just eventually walked away. And, and it was one of those games where, and we talk about this all the time, if, if, I don't, if I'm not playing it all the time, I can't go back to a game like this. It's not even trying to like get back into the story. It just requires so much skill and building and foundational building. And, but I have no problem with this game being on the list. Yeah. No, I don't either. This is a game that uh, I kind of, much like you, I, I didn't finish it. And I don't know if I got really far enough in it to really even put it on the list as like a, a genuine, as like a show of like, ah, oh, it should be. But I do feel like it's one of those games. It was, it was the closest game before Sekiro that got me to really, like, it, it was almost there. It was almost pulling me in. And I don't know what it was. Maybe it was the lack of a grappling hook or something. I don't know, I don't know. I don't know what it is. But uh, that setting in particular, I have to the art design in that game is, is stellar. It is, I wish we had more games that looked like that in general. Just that yeah. gothic style. Yeah, Castlevania. I mean, it's yeah, a it's, Castlevania game. It's a very Castlevania experience. And, uh, yeah, no, I have no objections to this at all. Anyone want to speak about Bloodborne? I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah, lots of people. You guys know. Every single person raises their hand. So this <laughs> game kicked my ass the first, I'd say, 10 hours. And it then, I think what, there's a big debate in the industry now, is this game for everybody? As a marketing guy, I think From Software, From Software realizes they have a marketing segment that they can just plow dollars into, and I think that's not understood by the general, I think, Souls universe now. But this game is so... You got the level design, the obtuse storytelling. I don't think anybody does better than From, and I think they, do, they know that, and they are some of the smartest marketers in the entire software industry. Yeah, it's important to keep in mind Sony owns this IP. Um, and I would imagine Bloodborne would be remade just like Demon's Souls was. So I feel like the we'll idea, because he was mentioning about the marketing of like, 
you know, it seems like a bad marketing idea to have these games that are so, so tough. But it's weird because it's like this is one of those things that I feel like a lot of games industry people are the ones that are writing these articles and no one agrees with them. Like, clearly, From Software does not need your advice. I mean, sure, put out your opinion, but... Well, it reminds me a little bit of other studios like Paradox or something where it's like Paradox makes, what, the 4X, like, really hardcore, insane simulations. Like, that's, you, that's your thing. You're either into it or you're not. You know, then, and they're kind of uncomprom uncompromising in that, which I, I dig. Uh, so no problem with Bloodborne being on the list. Let's see what's at number eight. Oh, okay. Um, that's, uh, yeah, that's exactly where I had it. Look at that. So we're, we all voted for this one. Now, of course, Forbidden West just came out. I thought Forbidden West was awesome, better than Zero Dawn, in my opinion, and completely thrown under the bus by weird shit. I don't even want to get into it. I don't like it. <laughs> Everyone seems to have a, a, like a hatred for these like PlayStation exclusives lately, but I would argue that Zero Dawn, up to the point that it came out, was um, certainly one of the great, if not the greatest, open world um, you know, action RPG ever at that point. And I remember playing it at E3 when it was announced and shown and, and just being really flabbergasted by it, especially because Guerrilla is not a studio that was known for doing this. Of course, they did Killzone. They were a shooter studio. So... I like Horizon Zero Dawn. I love Horizon Zero Dawn. I think it's a perfect place, as you can see, on the list at number eight. And um, I wonder if you're skeptical of this placement. Uh, no, I mean, I, I understand why it's where it is. I, th I think it's an important game for Sony. I, I do think what's, what's most impressive about this game to me is the fact that Gorilla made it. That is, that is really what sells it. Uh, for like that to me is what justifies its placement on the list because it, it, it shows the versatility of a studio where you know not a lot of studios can transition in that way and do so much right you know it's very difficult even some of the best studios that exist today largely stay within a particular wheelhouse and that's because like of course that's what they do and and that's what's expected and it's what they've honed their skills at for a number of years number of decades in some in some instances um, and why, what, why fix what isn't broken? And the fact that Gorilla was like, hey, you know, we've, we've been making FPSs now for a while. Let's do something completely different. And they did it, and it wasn't a train wreck. Or it wasn't something that had, like, a lot of caveats to it. It wasn't like, oh, well, you can tell it's their first game. To me, it didn't feel that way. You know, even to me, like, when I play something like Overwatch, I'm like, this feels like a first... FPS, kind of. Not to say that it isn't fun or that it doesn't have its own merits, but I didn't feel that novice energy coming out of uh, Horizon Zero Dawn. But it also didn't necessarily grab me in the way that a lot of other uh, PS4 games did. So I put it pretty... <laughs> no, I think it's, I think it's fine. I, I think I put it at, at where I think it... It, sh it goes for me. Yeah, the audience was even more keen than me, but Dustin, you're, you're more in agreement with Chris. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, I feel like what's so impressive to me about this game is that a lot of times, um, and I guess going into the PS4 generation, thinking about open world games from the previous generation, is that it was kind of you expected a hit on the graphical fidelity for the sake of the open world. And Guerrilla just made something that looked incredible on, on the base PlayStation 4, which this actually came out at a great time, right, at the time of the PlayStation 4 Pro. I remember this was one of the first games that I played in HDR on PS4 Pro, and I just really love, I think in particular, too, just the uniqueness of its story and its setting, right? Uh, the, the idea of a, like, this post, post, post apocalypse and there's robot dinosaurs. And man, I, I know I was a bit mixed on the sequel, but I really just love how they went balls to the wall with the story. And it makes me really curious, like, for the third one. Yeah, there's it just keeps evolving, and they take it further and further. Agreed. Um, yeah, it sounds weird, because I remember when it was like, robot dinosaurs and this, like, Native American woman or something. What the hell is going on here? And then they actually, it's, it's pretty brilliant. The story, I, I love it, and I actually agree with you. I think the second, the embrace, I, you would have never guessed what the second one was even about. So, um, Zero Dawn shoutouts. Anyone want to speak briefly about Zero Dawn? 
And I'm going to start timing us so that we move at an appropriate cadence. Please speak. Yeah, so I actually played through this pretty recently and kind of to what you guys were talking about with Uncharted 4, uh, where they kept that cadence of stripping away, uh, you know, not dealing with side quests and all that. I kind of reached the point in this game that Dustin did with the sequel where I kind of was doing all the side quests in an OCD type fashion and then I just realized it was very dull, like I couldn't really care about these random side characters. And so, I don't know, how do you guys feel about these games, and I'm playing through Spider-Man PS4 right now, it's kind of the same thing where they just kind of feel compelled to have all this side content for more content, but like why? Like why don't more games feel like they can stick to that more streamlined uh, uncharted type approach. Not necessarily linear, but that you don't need all different kinds of side quests just because, right? Well, I think, unfortunately, it's what we see on the show. It's because many people, probably many of you, think look at game length as a virtue, and it's not. You know, look at how good Journey is, and and a, you know, a game like that. It's to me, I feel like there should be boldness in being and making tighter and more linear experiences, but. I disagree with you in that I think Horizon's texture comes from its world and all the people. I loved doing all the side quest stuff, especially in the sequel. Um, I just was disappointed that I was over-leveled, which is a bigger problem for me. By the way, I thought you guys would find this funny. I brought up my timer, and apparently I, was... I started timing something. It's 454 hours ago. So I can reset that now, and we can begin again. All right, let's see what the game, uh, next game is. Yeah, all right. Yeah, what happened here? Apparently, oh, I'm never, an egg. You never played it, or did did you did? No, play? we did the spoiler cast. Yeah, so what? I I don't know. Okay, I'm uh, the I don't know. Is this an egghead roundhead joke, Jono? Uh, Jono did have a little bit of creative liberty with this one. Yes, that's unbelievable that you didn't put this game on your list. Yeah, it's funny because I was thinking about it. It did cross my mind, and I was thinking about how uh, unsatisfying I thought the second playthrough was in its combat. And I like the world and I like the characters, but I don't know, didn't make the list, man. That's fair enough. What do you think about Final Fantasy VII Remake? I, th I liked it a lot more than I, I thought I would. I'll say that. Like, it, it is one of those games where I remember kind of dreading it <laughs> because I'm not, I'm not really a Final Fantasy person. Like, I don't really exist in that space. <sighs> Turn-based combat in general kind of doesn't appeal to me. On a, on a base instinct level. So when this game was coming out and I knew that it was going to be a big game that we had to cover, I remember being like, oh man, I gotta do it though. And I remember going through it and I was, I, 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 something surprised me, which was that I didn't absolutely hate it. And I was having a good time with it. And there were parts of it that I like, I remember that door that wouldn't render. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Dude, <laughs> like, that door, the PS1 door. Yeah, it was very weird. <laughs> did they ever fix that in the PS5? <laughs> well, I'm sure they must have. Yeah. No? Oh, they did. Yeah. Dude, they should have just kept it. They should have. That would have been bold. They should have updated it with like a more high fidelity version of that PS1 texture. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like it cleaned up the anti-aliasing. But I think, um, yeah, it, it's, I enjoyed it a lot. I, I, I feel like the mix of, of that weird, um, what do they call it? That that the the turn-based mix. Oh, it's like the yeah, the active turn-based. Active, uh, yeah, something. Well, that's they had some bullshit the marketing term for it, but it was good. And I remember that awesome. thinking that like this is a really interesting way to do this, and the fact that they were able to reinvent again, like Resident Evil 2 remake, just take something that was, you know, primitive and bring it kind of into the future. It's a remake of something that exists already, but it, it, it does so much more than what was there before, and it offers such a different experience. And I think it absolutely, that soundtrack also is like one of the most unparalleled soundtracks. Like, I, I can't even deny that. That's, it's, it's so incredible. That music is, is nostalgic to me, and I didn't grow up with that shit. Like, it, it, it defies reason. Yeah, no, the, the I was shocked by how good Final Fantasy VII Remake was, and I, I know people that have been listening to the show, even going back to my old jobs, knew I would hate on this game constantly. It's, just, it's impossible, it's not gonna happen. Wrong developers making it, CyberConnect 2, but then they made the right decision, they took CyberConnect off the game. That made me nervous, but then the, the result is extraordinary. I don't know how they took a game that's iconic and somehow made it even better. And 
it makes me interested in how they will continue it and also how many parts it will be. Because it feels like it'll be three parts. We basically only got the Midgar section of Final Fantasy VII. But it was awesome. It was an incredible game. And I'm so pleased to see it um, this high on the list. Does anyone want to speak for Final Fantasy VII Remake? Ooh, look at that. That's a crown. Colin, you got a uh, liking for that Nomura stink. Yeah, Apparently. I know. Yeah, broken clocks right twice a day, I guess. All right. I got to say, yeah. Final Fantasy VII Remake immaculate game Definitely. a game that was completely set up to fail okay like much like god of war which is going to show up later in the list i know oh my goodness final fantasy 7 remake immaculate game a perfect game from the visuals from the soundtrack from the gameplay just everything that was promised we received and i cannot compliment that game enough it is immaculate just one of the best. Thank you. Appreciate that. And by the way, uh, you want to talk about waifu or whatever, uh, three good options in Final Fantasy VII yeah. Remake. And I would argue three very good options. Uh, Jesse, of course. I mean, of course. <laughs> uh, all right. Let's see what's next. Oh. That goes to Tsushima. Wait, what happened? You didn't put this on your list either? That's weird, dude. That's weird. <laughs> listen, listen. I realized after, like when I finalized my list and sent it to Ben, I'm like, something isn't quite right here. But then after, when I did realize, I was like, oh, I didn't put Ghost on there. I was like, well, maybe that was my subconscious. It was Days Gone that was something. missing off your list, probably. It was, uh, it was strange, but I, I mean, it, it is what it is. It is. So, I, First of all, I'm kind of torn on this game, not in that I don't think it's wonderful, because I do, but that I don't know that I think it's as good as a lot of people think it is. But I think it is one of PlayStation 4's iconic exclusives, and I think that it's clearly its swan song, which I think makes it important to the console. Especially, and we talked about it, I mean, I, I kind of was wishing this into existence and was wrong. I was like, The Last of Us Part Two is going to embarrass this game. Like, It's not going to sell, no one's going to care about it, why are they releasing it afterwards? And obviously, that wasn't true. Mm -hmm. Now... We'll talk more about The Last of Us, I'm sure, soon. But what do you think about its conclusion here on the list? Oh, I, 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 I love it, man. I, I think it's a wonderful game. I, th I think, it's from a visual perspective, I think it's just one of the most pleasing experiences that's available on PlayStation. I think the way they handle open-world UI is really like refreshing and appreciated. Uh, the, the way that the wind guides you, and, and e even subtly, like when you're not even necessarily triggering it with the... the the trackpad, it's, it's always breezing in the direction that you're supposed to be going. And I, I love that in-universe kind of diegetic explanation of like how you get to where you go without breaking the immersion factor of being in this place at this time in history. And I just, I found, I just found everything about it just very, like a lot better than I thought it would be. I, I found the con that the combat had a lot more depth than I was anticipating with the different stances and how you had to really switch on a dime, especially if you were like in the middle of a large group of enemies, you really had to manage those stances. And it, it, it's, it's a very skillful game on, uh, in, in certain areas. And, and I think the, I liked the, the characters, I liked even, even the side objectives, which I usually hate. Uh, and I find, even in games that I adore, like Spider-Man, where it's just like, okay, I picked up a backpack and I found a bobblehead of some Easter egg character from a comic that I've never fucking heard of in my life. And then he's gonna say something cheeky about it and I, I just wasted like five whole minutes looking for this damn thing to get a platinum, you know? And it's, it, but in Ghost of Tsushima, it's, it's these haikus that you're putting together and there's no wrong answer to them. I think that's fun. And, and, and the, the, the foxes that guide you to these different places and the birds that They're guide so you. It's such a pleasant, like audio visual experience. Uh, and even with the story being like, you know, arguably like a little formulaic, there's nothing particularly incredible about the story as, as far as, as, far as the, the writing or, or the, the message goes. But I did find the, the idea of focusing on this, this poison angle very compelling. Like it was the most compelling part of the game, narratively speaking for me. I didn't really care much about, you know, these interpersonal conflicts between, you know, like these other characters that was like, some obvious betrayer who's like, okay, you're, okay, you're that character, okay, that's fine. But I, I found that point of the narrative very, very just interesting and, and 
yeah, like, what do you do when <laughs> you live in this time where you're like, we can't use poison? Like, it's, it's not honorable, but it's like, but we'll, we'll win. Like, what do you mean? You just want to lose? It's insane. Like, and I love that. I love agreeing or, like, seeing the, the, the conflict for what it actually is and, and just, uh, I, I just, I really appreciated that aspect of the story that I feel like a lot of people maybe didn't really care that much about. But I think overall, it's just a very, it's, it's one of, if not the most pleasant uh, experiences that you can have on, on the PS4. Just looking at that game is gorgeous. As the sword pleasantly. Yeah, it's, it through. is, man. It's satisfying. And that also, <laughs> shout out to that multiplayer mode that they put out for free. Yeah, that They didn't have to. That is actually like shockingly good and shockingly competent and functions really, really well as a live service. Like it's just, it's a, it's a damn good game. And I think, I think it is one of the PS4's very best. I think the great compliment to this game is even though they admitted right off the bat that it wasn't going to be historically accurate and they pointed all those things out, which I thought was cool, to save themselves. It's a great compliment. This game was made in Washington State by a bunch of white dudes, a bunch of Western dudes, and it's considered in Japan like an iconic game. Yeah. Um, and I think that that's a great compliment to the work they did, and I'm excited to see more about it. But um, is there anyone out there that wants to quickly speak on Ghost? Uh, yeah, it was, it was kind of what Colin was saying before. I just want to just emphasize like how I appreciate that Sucker Punch was just like, we have this vision, we're going to make it, and I know there's going to be certain people in the media and on social media that are just like, oh, you can't do that. But I think it's important to put art in people's visions first because without that, we don't, we don't get stuff like this. And, we're, and it's, it's being taken away from us. And I think it was really cool that they just said, we're going to make this game, and we don't care. I agree. And they obviously came right out with the, even that white flute player at E3 that year, and everyone oh, yeah, was yeah. freaking out about that. But Oh, yeah. And he's uh, like a leading expert in that instrument. Yeah, and then he's like a world-class player of that Japanese instrument. Okay. Uh, we're in the top five. Uh, this is when you might really start disappointing me. So let's make sure that the number one <laughs> game is where it belongs. Let's go. All right. Oh. Dude. N.A. It's number one. Wait, what? Okay. Wow. Dude, you're of... going to get booed out of your own event. <laughs> this is my show. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it okay for me to have like a 20, not have a 26th or 27th game? <laughs> Other games on my list included River City Girls, <laughs> Hollow Knight, and The Division 2. God of War, iconic remake. Uh, Save Santa Monica Studio, I think. And I think this is a, one of the, uh, the big surprises of the generation. I, I don't know that people quite expected it to be as good as it was going to be. My problem and why I don't, again, I had a list of probably 100 games and I had to narrow it down. The reason I bumped this one is because I, I said it over and over again. What doesn't it do? It doesn't do the little things right. And games need to do the little things right. Uh, navigation, quick travel, bad. Map, bad. Hub world, bad. That uh, stupid Valkyrie queen, bad. <laughs> so, uh, but no doubt, I mean, I, I, again, every game on my list I, I love, but there are probably another several dozen that I also love. So it's no insult from me that it's not going to be on here. And I was also comfortable not really necessarily voting for it because I knew that it would still rise to the top. And obviously, here it is. So uh, Dustin, what, what do you have to say about God of War? Yeah, this game really made me a God of War fan. And it's not, I don't have like any active hate for those old ones, but it just kind of passed me by when, I, when they were new. And it's just... Uh, it's so cool how they were able to take the combat of the old games and somehow kind of finagle it into this new third person over the shoulder. And guys, I, I know this is the audience number one. Yeah. I have one thing to say. The Leviathan Axe. An amazing weapon. The feeling, and I love that one of the, uh, in that documentary, the Raising Kratos documentary, I think they talked about how they just worked on that, the, the pullback ability of that ax probably for months and months and months, and they just nailed it. And uh, I don't know, 
if we should talk about something else I want to say, but I'm going to keep it not as a spoiler about another weapon that you use. Yeah, yeah, don't, yeah, don't, yeah, spoil, yeah. don't spoil. Uh, but that was, that was a cool thing. Uh, I don't know. I think this game, I, see, the thing is, is that, and I'm friends with David Jaffe, so, who made God of War, of course, and the original, and he used to, I used to bust his balls about it, which was, Kratos sucks, and it needed, it <laughs> needed a new, a new flavor, this Norse flavor, and it worked. I mean, it was really fun. I was surprised by how good it was. What, what do you have to say about it? Yeah, I mean, it was, it was a surprise. I remember looking, I, I remember looking uh, forward to it because I expected to really hate it. And I, I like, because it felt like to me, and I've said this before, but it felt like it's like, oh, they're doing The, the Last of Us, but with Kratos. You know, it's like, oh, they're giving him a kid. Cool. We're going to see Dad of War. And I remember being, like, eager to make fun of it, because it's like, what are, the, what are the odds that a studio is going to reboot a very important franchise, change nearly everything about it, from the way that characters are written, from the from the mythologies that the game center around to the style of game that it is. How many studios can do that and do it well? Probably not a lot of people. Probably not a lot. And so I remember just playing through it, being like, all right, I'm looking forward to seeing what a disaster this is. And five hours later, I was like, oh, it's not a disaster. I think I really like this. And 10 hours in, I was like, this is kind of incredible. And then 15 hours in, I was, this is amazing. And it just kept getting better to me. Like, and I feel like it, it also is one of those games that I feel like ends exactly at the right time. There's like, uh, a lot of games overstay their welcome, even some of my favorites. But you know, that game kind of ended exactly at the point where I feel like if it had continued a little bit longer, it would have, it would have been like, extremely tedious. There's specifically that one area towards the end where I could tell that they were like, trying to stretch it out like, a little bit with that, that elevator monster closet thing. Where it's just like, oh hey, you're in a you're in a uh, uh, an empty rectangle, and now you're gonna fight the the first levels guys. Isn't that fun? It's like, all right, now well, guess what? Shocker! You're gonna go to the second level, and it's gonna be the second levels guys in the same rectangular room, and you gotta do that like five times or something for all the realms and like Niflheim and all these places. I'm just like, uh, uh, this all right? It's 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 starting to get this is starting to get bad, but it doesn't. After that, it's it's great. And then it ends. It's, it's a really well done game, and I, I, I applaud Santa Monica Studio for just pulling it off. Like, it couldn't have been easy. I bet there was a lot of consternation on that team working on something uh, that was going to be no doubt controversial. But I think it paid off for them. I, th I think God of War is fantastic. Yeah, well said. I, uh, very interested to see this sequel and what's going on with it. Yeah. New director, Corey's out. He also left Twitter, so I don't know. People are really wondering what's going on with him. But uh, we'll find out. Does anyone want to speak about God of War quickly? It really makes you feel like a God of don't War. You, aren't you, for all you, by the way, for all you guys that were complaining about how long Sacred Symbols was, you don't like it when I'm rushing you, do you? <laughs> one, one thing I will say about this game is the sound design sold it for me. So I played this at my buddy's house before I bought it, and he had a whole sound system with a subwoofer and everything. And I was, I'm a big Souls person, but I really figured out how to parry and block and do combos in this game. And when you block an attack with a shield, the rumble that just ripples through the room, just, and then you attack. Like, it's amazing to play this game. Like you, oh, that it, sounds awesome. It, yeah. I, wish I, I wish I had a sound system. It was, it was funny, because I, I, I don't, you know, I usually don't care too much about sound design, and it was Horizon that I was, the second one that I started playing on my uh, Pulse headset, and... Uh, became more of a believer, but um, we have four games left. I think I know what four games they are. I think we all do. I think it's just a matter of what order they're presented in. I'm going to keep us to a strict five minutes each so we don't run out of time. So begin now, and let's see what the next game is. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Man, you guys really have no taste. Uh, the Last of Us, and we can all speak to it, but The, the Last of Us Part Two is, um, in my mind, maybe, maybe, I don't know. It's certainly one of the greatest games of all time. And, and the first one, of course, is one of the greatest games of all time, too. But this was a game that I think was victimized in some way by this weird leak cycle that seemed like it was showing things about the game. People didn't like, obviously, 
a major decision that's made in the beginning of the game about the characters. And I get that, but I don't know why we don't... What, what, what did we want out of a sequel to The Last of Us? If we didn't want a sequel to The Last of Us, then that's fine. Um, I think that that's reasonable. But if you wanted a sequel, then I don't know that it could have been more impactful than this. This game made me upset. But in like a, a good, I mean, first of all, it's like 25 hours long. It's just relentlessly bleak and dark. It just gets darker and darker and more and more bleak and more and more bloody and more and more violent. And I know that doesn't appeal to a lot of people. That's fine. But I loved it. And I thought it was... There's certain scenes at the end where like, it almost took my breath away, where I was like, I can't believe how sad this is. I can't believe how horrifying this is. I can't believe how much I care about this shit. It's so weird. Why do I care? And I even cared about Abby. Uh, you know, and I cared about her, too. And that, I, that, to me, I think was part of the game that people didn't understand. It's like, I think it's interesting to see what was happening on the other side of the first game and how the choices that Joel and Ellie made actually really fucked up a bunch of stuff for these other people and we had this only this one myopic view of what happened with them without the larger picture of all the things they did that were wrong. Um, so we have, I'm sorry, I took two of those five minutes. Uh, Dustin. That's okay. Uh, yeah, so this game, for me, it's weird because I feel like people have always asked me, like, Dustin, you weren't on Sacred Symbols yet. You weren't part of the two infamous uh, Last of Us Part Two right, spoiler cast. The only time we did a spoiler cast where people were so upset about the spoiler <laughs> cast that we did another one and you were even more upset about that one. Yeah, and I feel like my opinion about this game is, I, I, I don't want to say not exciting, but I feel like this game has a lot of highs. That You talk about those moments that take your breath away. I mean, there's many of those and it's, it's really well done in those, those segments, but there's other times where I feel like it's a like too on the nose. It's like we get what you're trying to say, what the what the emphasis is. It's and it's weird too because I think you're right, Colin, about how people treated this game based on the leak. Like you said, the one of the very first things that happened in the game. I don't know. Can we should we say it? I, I don't. No, don't. No, I won't say it. Since we're getting so high, these are games. But yeah. there's something that happened so early on in this game that just enraged people. And I'm just like, so what? That's uh, like an interest, yeah. at least it's interesting, right? right? Like that's the, what what uh, they were bold enough to do something that I think they knew. I don't know. Maybe Neil has told you. Like, I wonder if they knew like that certain decisions were going to severely divide people. I'm surely not to the degree, but that's why. I, I, like, even if I didn't like that decision, I would still respect it because it is interesting and bold. What do you think, Chris? Yeah, I mean, I think it is a you know divisive game, and I do appreciate divisive. I, I, I was talking uh, backstage about the Batman movie, where like a lot of people hate that movie, and a lot of people really love it, and I, I like that more than things like Spider Man, which is like you know every it's a crowd pleaser, so everybody loves it. I I appreciate The Last of Us Two for what it does in the sense that it's not a game that doesn't make you feel nothing. You know, it, it does make you feel things, and the worst thing a game can be is bland and forgettable and leave no emotional impact on you whatsoever. I think that's like the worst that a game can be. And The Last of Us 2 does not do that. It succeeds at making you feel something, and, and it's not a pleasant feeling, and it's certainly not a... a I don't a, think it's a fun game. It's, no. Like, that's, that's what I love about it, is that it's like, I know it's weird to say it's like, it's like it dares to do something else. It dares to say, like, you're playing it. I, yeah. You know? Th I appreciate it. But, like, you're, you're, you're certainly playing the game. I, but, yeah, I appreciate I, a lot of things yeah. about it. I, th I think it's, technologically speaking, I think it's very impressive. Um, but it just, it did not click with me in a way that I feel like I have valued. And really the only reason it's on the list at all for me is because I recognize those impressive parts. And, you know, the technological aspect and, and the fact that it does make an impact. It's just not an impact that I necessarily cared for or wanted. Yeah, it's like, it, it's, I get that. To me, it's like, I, I don't, I've said this before, I don't always sit down to play a game to be like, I want to have fun, you know? Like, sometimes I want to have an experience. Sometimes I want to have a story. I want to, like, learn something or see something different. And if I want to have, like, pure fun, I'll go play, like, an NES game or something like that. But if I want to have, like, more, then I'm going to go for a game like The Last of Us Part Two, which I think is fun to play, but it's almost, it's, it's hard to play. It's gruesome. It makes you feel... And that's what the potential of games is. Now, because we're running out of time, I'm sorry, we're not gonna go to the audience anymore. I apologize about that. But I wanna make sure we get through all these games and give them enough time. So let's see number three. 
Yeah. Oh. So, wow, Dustin, you really brought this one down. Let's start with you on... on, uh, on yeah, I mean, okay. I think the thing, the reason why I probably uh, rated it so low is that I have no memory of what happened in the story of this game <laughs> at all. Oh, really? And, dude, I mean, the, the, the thing for me about this game, I think, I mean, why I, I ranked it, period, is just that the, the traversal in this game, this is a game that you can just boot up and just fly around the city for 20 to 30 minutes and probably have a fantastic time. And obviously it's much more than that uh, with, its, with its combat um, and its open world design, stuff like that. And the, the way that they were able to scale down Manhattan in a way that felt authentic but clearly wasn't actually to scale, but it feels to scale in a way at the same time. Uh, this is just a, a fantastic game and I'm really curious about the uh, sequel. Yeah, me too. I I f agree with you that just slinging around is fun. It, it, yeah. There's something really fun, intuitive about the game. Also a vital game. I mean, it, it brought Insomniac, I think, to the next level and it convinced Sony to buy Insomniac um, and invest in that. They worked an angle to get a really vibrant relationship going with Marvel and it's f giving more fruit. Wolverine now is gonna be the next one of these for PlayStation. So uh, what do you have to say about Spider-Man? I know you're very passionate about it. Yeah, it's, it's, I think, is it the first game I platinumed? It's it's one of the it's one of the two because I know I know I can take Crash Team Racing right, but it's you know it's <laughs> it's a great game like I I I'm a big Spider-Man fan in general like I I'm not really into comics really that that much or or superheroes in general like I, I appreciate Batman and, and certain things, but Spider-Man is is that that character for me where like I'm always interested in and also he's just had like a really good run with games as well like in comparison to most like what, what's the a recent Superman game that you've played you know like they haven't figured that out but Spider-Man Superman been, Returns Spider-Man's been kicking it for a while uh, ever since the PS1 Neversoft games I've just always had an appreciation for these for this character and the, and the way that uh, people design games around him and I think that it does such a good job of you know, I mean, it's gonna sound it's gonna sound like a meme, but it really it, it makes you feel like Spider-Man. You know, the traversal is really solid and really good, especially like how you can like weave certain combat maneuvers into your traversal as well to kind of like customize it a little bit. And you know, that story I think is great. I think the way they characterized or, or recontextualized Doctor Octopus is like really really satisfying and really cool. Um, it gives like a completely different perspective on that character, which is a, a character that I've always loved since the Raimi movie, but. It's just a really fun game. And it's emotionally impactful too. Like it, it ends on like a really sad note. And it's another game that does not, it does not overstay its welcome. You know, there are parts of it that drag a little bit specifically like, okay, we get it. Miles is, is a stealth person and, and Mary Jane is a stealth person and, and I have to do weird oh. hexic HD puzzles in the I laboratory. And, but, Outside of that, like every part of the game is like stellar. Yeah, I forgot like, about the MJ stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. They, they added a puzzle skip, thank God. But it's a fantastic game, and it's definitely like a must, a must play. Yeah. Like, even if you're not a Spider-Man fan, I think you would. I think, I think that you would love it. It's really solid. I agree. I think it's one of those re reverse things we were talking about with Hogwarts Legacy and some other stuff where it could act as your conduit into the IP. I think it's that good because I'm not a. Yeah, you know, I like Spider-Man, but I'm not a huge fan. But much of what I know about Spider-Man, which I know, much I know about Batman and all these other things come from video games and movies and not necessarily from the source material. So of course Spider-Man belongs on there. Now, uh, number two, Kojima. Yeah. Yes! <laughs> Chris, you might have your, your number one be the highest on the list because my, my number one's been burned and so is Colin's. So oh man! This is Death Stranding is a uh, a shocking game. I I can't believe how good it is. It's impossible to describe and make it sound good. That's why I find it so interesting. It's literally about a man who delivers packages <laughs> in a post apocalypse, and for some reason it is incredibly impactful. I remember when we all played it that that late fall when I was leaving L.A and we were all just kind of mesmerized by it. I think it was Control and then that game, and we were just like, wow, this is, we're getting some good shit here. Yeah. And uh, so we all love this game, and we all have something to say about it. Why don't we start with you, Chris? I just, 
this was another game that I was looking forward to just making fun of because the, the the trailers like oh it's like it's just walking and Kojima this this story seems so pretentious and full of itself and like what the hell is this what is this nonsense and then you play it and I know for different people it has different times to click for me it clicked like immediately and I don't know how to explain why but it's a game that really makes you you're you are engaged through like a hundred percent of this experience because the enemy that you are fighting is not like some AI it's not you know a boss although there are certain areas where that does happen the primary enemy of the game is the terrain and you're constantly assessing it and you're constantly paying attention to every step that you're taking to the point where you know, you climb a mountain and then you, you descend the other side and you look back at that mountain and that mountain feels like you've beaten a boss. It feels like an accomplishment in ways that when you do this exact same thing in other games, it doesn't feel like anything because it's, it's automated. You press forward and you go. You jump onto this, you know, this highlighted thing and it, it, and it takes you there. You don't actually have to think about like your weight and how you're shifting things and, and it's so engaging in ways that I was just not anticipating. And the fact that Kojima could do something like this is just, it's, it's incredible to me. It's, it's like playing Death Stranding made me want to go back and reassess how I, how I viewed a lot of the, his older work. It made me want to go back to, well, maybe I was a little harsh on Metal Gear Solid 2 for being about Raiden, who's whiny, yeah. you know? And then I played Metal Gear Solid 2 again, and I was like, this is, this is great. Yeah, it, like, re Death Stranding recontextualized Ko Kojima like, entirely to me. And I just think it's a beautiful, beautiful game. Uh, and one that, you know, my roommates were, were watching me play it. Because, and they were, having, they were laughing the whole time because I was just like tripping and I was like, I was losing all my shit in like a river only to be saved by a ladder that someone else <laughs> left. Right. And it's this like, this competitive cooperation aspect to this multiplayer as well, where it's, it's a multiplayer game where you never see anybody else. And th your only interactions with other people are their impacts on the environment and on the world to the point where there's almost like this competitive system where you want to get likes uh, for your contribution to the world so you compete with others by being extra helpful. You know, like you just like, oh, how can this specific zip line help not only me, but everybody else who's going to go through this area again, or anybody who's coming in after me? There's like a competitive aspect to being helpful to people, which is insane. I don't know how you do that. I don't know how you intend to do that and do it successfully. Yep. The fact that this probably happened by accident is insane. And I just, it's, it is, I, I could talk about this game for a really, really long time. I just think it's a very special game, even with the, you know, the, the it, it gets a little long in the tooth at the end. You know, there are, <laughs> there's a part where you just gotta go back through the map again and again. And then the story isn't, you know, there's that line, what is it, was it Princess Beach? Or whatever the hell? Do you remember that? No. You don't remember the Princess Beach I, line? I, re I no. remember, Chris. I, mean, <laughs> I, don't, I can't explain this to you if you don't remember it. There's no way for me to do it. But it's, it's not the story that engages me. It's, it's the atmosphere and the world that they've built and the way that the gameplay systems really just absorb you into it. And I've taken absolutely all of this time <laughs> to talk about this. No, please. Dustin. Yeah, so Colin, I was thinking about what you said about how it's a game about delivering packages, but it, there's more elements I was thinking if you list them out on paper. Uh, you know, there's, there's a character called Die Hardman. Uh, there's <laughs> yeah. an enemy called Homo Demons. And you play as Norman Reedus and drink monster energy drink. And when you drink too much, you can take a piss and a mushroom grows out of the ground. Like there's just yeah, it's very weird. layers upon layers of absurdity. And man, whatever Kojima is on when he wrote some of this stuff, like I, I need some of that. Cause it just, well, well, and the other thing too, yeah. um, and a, a, a serious point is that we were talking about Metal Gear Solid Five earlier and how we didn't like how he incorporated, uh, what's his name, Keith or, Kiefer Sutherland yeah. into it. And I feel like this is like the idea, and he did, actually did it right. Like he got legit Hollywood actors and made it make sense in this medium. And this is a game that I feel like uh, we can look to and be like, yeah, this is actually how we combine Hollywood and games together in a way 
that makes sense. And maybe that is Norman Reedus riding his bike and saying, this bike should go on Norman yeah. Reedus' ride. Nicholas like, Winding <laughs> Refn in his, in his heart lab or whatever the hell. Yeah, that was, there was so many, uh, I, I must say, I love Troy Baker's character in it. Not necessarily the performance, but just the visuals of like this Egyptian pharaoh looking villain. I also liked that, except for the boss fights where you had to fight, I didn't fight anything in the game. And yeah. I, and, um, I like that a lot. I like nonviolent games when you can play them that way. And I will also just say that it's clever because they made it so quickly in about three years because there is nothing in it. They, I mean, it's, it's true. They worked on Decima, the engine, and then they made the environment, and then they made this physics system, and they're like, well, we don't have to have monster closets. We don't have to have enemy AI, really. We don't have to do anything. And, and it's, the, it's the point. Yeah, it worked really well. All right, let's talk about Red Dead Redemption 2. <laughs> oh! <laughs> Love it. Wow, our number one's changed. <laughs> Amazing. Yep. All right, Red Dead Redemption 2. I don't think uh, anyone's surprised by this. Dang. Um, so what can really be said about this game that we, I mean, we, we opine about this game constantly because it is so impressive. I feel like there's something interesting about, well, of course there is, but about a team that has infinite amounts of money, which they do. Rockstar, of course, Grand Theft Auto. And they can just take their time and do whatever they want. Literally just do whatever they want. And they made a game that is so, in some ways, so mundane and, al and alive that that's part of what's so alluring about it. It's like, oh, I'm gonna go to town and I can just be in this town and I can just do whatever I want. I can play poker, I can go start some trouble at the bar, maybe I'll take a bath and go visit a brothel and then you know, I'm gonna go steal this horse, I'll do this side quest. And, and it's, I, I think we all felt the same way as we were playing it that fall, which was, was like, Jesus Christ, how, how do you do something like this? And the answer is you do it with $500 million and thousands of people. And we make fun of games like Grand Theft Auto Online all the time, and that's fine, but that money funded this game. And now this game sold 35 or 40 million copies, so they're perfectly fine, but this is the example of two parts of a, of a, a unit working off of each other and using the, the funds and the, and the experiences and all of that, and now what are we gonna get? Grand Theft Auto 6, as they ping pong back. So I, don't, I had no doubt that this game was gonna be number one. What do you think, Chris? Oh man, like this, this is one of those experiences that I think it behooves you to have. Like I, I do think this is just one of the, I, th I genuinely think this is probably the best narrative I've seen in a, in a video game. Like I've never cared about a character in a video game more than I care about Arthur Morgan and everything that he's going through and there, there's so many great, like all these characters feel real and they interact in ways that, that feel like authentic and, and the game does this like really natural uh, gameplay driven cinematography thing where there's this great scene where you're, you're approaching the manor with your, your, with your, uh, with your uh, camp and it's just lit so beautifully and it doesn't wrestle the control of the camera away from you, it's just that's where you naturally go and it's presented like a movie. I, I, when I finished this game I felt like I watched like a Breaking Bad tier television show like front to back, like I binged it and, and just like, wow, these characters are incredible. Like, I wish I, I wish I could share this game with people who don't play games, you know? Like, it, it's a story that I think is just very captivating and, and just the idea of these, these outlaws kind of dealing with the end of their way of life and just this, this every man caught in the middle of it with a great, great, great twist and just, I... I get lost thinking about it. Well, this is one of those games where I think about my dad, who's out there, uh, and others where I'm like, if I can just convince you what video games are, like what, that you would like them, this is a game for you. you know, uh, what do you think about Red Dead 2? Man, this game, it's, it's funny because we talk a lot about how we want shorter games and we like <laughs> the condensed nature, but... The length of this game, I think, is one of its strongest aspects. Seeing how this strong crew of, of uh, outlaws start, and it's like they're always on the run to the next thing, to the next thing, and it's like eventually it's going to break down. And seeing that fall and the way it progresses, man, it's just so fantastically done. And, of course, shout out Arthur Morgan as a character. Yeah, he's it's awesome. It's just... It, it was hard to think, like, when, when this game was announced that 
you wouldn't be playing as the character, the main character from the, the previous game, and that's a, a bold move. And the fact that they were able to make such a likable character in Arthur, and I mean, of course, like the other characters, of course, Dutch, uh, yeah, who's always thinking I about got, the next score, I got a plan. Arthur! I got a plan. Know? Uh, Micah is such a bastard too. Like they, they realize those characters so freaking well. Like everybody, yeah. every, even the minor like ones. And, and it's funny too because we've been talking for four and a half minutes and we haven't even really touched on, on the gameplay very much. And it's funny because I don't know if there's anything that's like top tier about no. Red no, Dead Redemption shooting not. or you know riding the horse. In fact, sometimes it's annoying, but it's clearly its other elements are, are so strong that it's, it, it's okay. This is a game that I, I desperately think about returning to, and I think, I don't know how you guys felt, but I felt, especially towards the end, like I was rushed, like I didn't want to get anything no, we, spoiled. We were rushed too, because we were trying to do the spoiler cast, which we've got, gotten away from that rush. Since yeah. In this new era of Sacred, we would have never done that. Right, so this is a game that just someday I think I need to start and just play for like a year. And you just play like a few hours, and it's like a, a, a great novel that you go through and just enjoy slowly. Yeah. You treat, like, treat a chapter like a season. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's good stuff. I'm Red Dead 2, uh, very welcome, number one game on our list. Um, so, um, Ben, I'm told we have, what, t 10 minutes now, 8 minutes, something like that now? Yep, that's correct. Okay, cool. So, I want to take a moment. Do we have anything else to show? We don't have anything else to show. Um, a photographer would love to get pictures of uh, all the performers tonight, though, before, with the audience before we leave. Okay, cool. So I want to just take a few minutes um, uh, to just touch on some things, if that's all right with you guys, before we go. Okay, so uh, number one, uh, Herbroxia 2 is out on PS5 right <laughs> now. Um, you got the platinum, you said? Oh, it's impossible. But although, uh, two people already have it, which, um, so I guess it's not impossible. I'm not even going to try, because I'm not good enough. Uh, Barry got it, though. So, um, so I wanted to say a few things uh, at the top, or at the bottom, I guess. I should have said this at the top, maybe, but I didn't. Uh, I want to thank you all again for being here. Uh, this is something that we try to take seriously enough to do something that's fun and entertaining and informative, and we know that you utilize it in your own lives. Like, some of you drive trucks, and some of you, you know, are plumbers, and... And we know that we, we're just in your ear, or you're watching us on YouTube or whatever. And it means a lot to us that you're willing to give us your time, and um, for a lot of you, when you're being here, your resources and allowing us to do this. Um, you know, there was a story that broke a couple of weeks ago out of, uh, I, or it was about IGN, my old place, where they were talking about how they pay their freelancers $20 a story or something like that now. And that's horrifying. Um, and your support allows us to pay people properly and well. Um, it allows, you know, we're, we have American-made merch, for instance, and all of that. So I want to thank you um, for that. It's much appreciated. Um, and I also want to um, warmly congratulate my two co-hosts. I, I think uh, I've been doing PlayStation podcasts for a really long time. I was on all three of the major ones. And uh, it's not easy to come in and do it. And um, I want to congratulate Chris, and I want to congratulate Dustin for doing a really great job. Um, and thank you again, Ben, you, for setting this all up. You do, you do a wonderful job. We love your gruff attitude. One other thing I want to leave you guys with is in 2019, it's probably like the worst year of my life. And I didn't know what I was going to do. I was in a really toxic situation. I was in a really bad situation. My parents and my family were begging me to move and leave California. And I came to Virginia not really sure of what it would be. And um, since they're here, I want to just take a moment to acknowledge and thank my family. Um, for helping me. I think, you know, I was in California for 13 years. I always joked around on the shows how the Continental Divide kept me from my family and it allowed me to do whatever I want and all of that, but the reality was is that I really missed everyone. Um, and 
I kind of came back a different person than I left when I was graduating college. I'm much more quiet and reserved and kind of almost reclusive. Um, and my family worries about that, but I want them to know uh, that just being around you um, and being in your vicinity, as opposed to being in California, has been very helpful to me. Um, and so thank you, because I think it's made the shows better than ever. Um, it strengthened us. And, and of course, much love to Micah as well, who has brought um, a lot of strength and stability into my life that was much needed. So I wanted to acknowledge them. So with that, um, Ben, do you want to do the pictures now with the audience? Yeah, we'll do the pictures now. We probably should, uh, I don't know if we can uh, do house lights and then kill the projector as well, if that's possible. I want to remind you guys, while we're getting everybody in place, we'll have merch on the way out. Make sure to see Holly and Micah. Thank them. Uh, I thank them for everything. Yes, yeah, so and thank you, Holly. Call them Sister Allie as well. Um, make sure you check out her stuff. It's awesome, handmade. Um, other than that, I think we're just going to get set up here and we'll do a picture with the whole crowd. Uh, and if we can get house lights and kill a projector, if that's poss easily possible, then um, we'll get a picture with everybody and then uh, get out. Sacred Symbols, a PlayStation podcast, is a product and trademark of Last Stand Media and Collins Last Stand LLC and is proudly recorded in the USA. The show is conceived by, is written by, and is directed by me, Colin Moriarty. My co-hosts are Chris Raygun Maldonado and Dustin Furman. The show is produced by executive producer Dustin Furman. It's edited by associate producer Ben Smith. All of Last Stand's theme music is by my best friend, Ramon Narvaez. As you know, all of Last Stand's shows, including Sacred Symbols, are fan-funded on Patreon at patreon.com slash laststandmedia. The following names are at the producer level on Patreon, our highest tier, and we're grateful for your thoughtful and kind contributions to our independent endeavor. Thank you.